G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. And before the video begins, I would like to give Audible another big shout out for sponsoring this video. So, if you're unaware of what Audible actually is, it's basically a huge online library of audiobooks that is legitimately unmatched in size and selection. They offer originals, broadcasters, news, comedy, audiobooks, and so, so much more. And Audible have been super generous in providing me with a link for you guys to sign up with and receive a pretty sweet deal. Audible are actually offering all of you guys a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30-day free trial. I actually signed up myself, and another title that I would highly recommend is the Stephen King classic The Mist. It's a really intriguing horror story about a strange fog-like mist that sweeps over a US town and it has a crazy ending that I won't spoil for you guys. I'm currently still listening through the last title in the Passage trilogy by Justin Cronin as my free audiobook for the month. I'm about a quarter of the way through and I found myself listening to it at night recently just huddled up under some blankets in bed with a hot drink and it's been a really nice way to unwind. And one thing that I personally loved about the Audible membership too is that at the beginning of every month, you can choose any audiobook as your free audiobook, and any titles you choose, you actually own them. Which is great because you can go back and re-listen any time, even if you cancel your membership. And the cool thing is, is that your free audiobook for the month can actually be of any value, even if it's of higher value than the membership price, which is about 15 bucks a month, and means that you can save a ton of money. It also means that you have literally nothing to lose and everything to gain by signing up. Oh, and uh, you can listen anywhere, anytime, on any device, enjoy easy audiobook exchanges, and even roll over credits. So, all you have to do to start listening and capitalize on this excellent offer, guys, is go to audible.com forward slash bbuster or text bbuster to 500, 500 to get a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30-day free trial. That's audible.com forward slash b-e-b-u-s-t-a or text B-E-B-U-S-T-A to 500-500 to get a free audiobook, two free Audible originals, and a 30-day free trial. I really do hope you guys take up Audible's generous offer here and enjoy it. But without further ado, let's begin. So my cousin and I, along with her eight-year-old sister, were driving back to my place from their mum's house after spending two nights there for the Super Bowl and whatnot. It was this huge family event and even though half of us don't watch football, all the in-laws of the family do. Now, I admit that uh, when I'm driving, I, I get heated when there are idiots on the road. Uh, not full-blown via someone off the highway heated, but just heated. We hadn't been on the road for that long until a truck was seen a little ways onward. This dude was going unbearably slow in the fast lane too. Also, I need to note that this was around 12am and very few people were out driving. So I put on my right indicator attempting to move past this guy and go on my way, but as soon as I merge into the next lane in order to pass, the guy in front does the same thing and slams on his brakes. I remember hearing my cousins gasp in surprise and I was so ticked off and startled that I swerved into the left lane while blaring my horn and giving the man the middle finger. Not even 10 seconds later too, my cousin in the back says, the man is coming to us really fast. The same dude who was going really slow before is now almost hitting the back end of my car. He's blaring on his horn, swerves his truck to the far left and tries to make me crash into the upcoming ditch and we're all screaming in the car with my cousin in the passenger seat shouting at me to take the next exit. The man is still following us and blaring his horn and tailgating me too. I was already pushing 90 at this point with a light up ahead but I didn't want to slow down while this lunatic was behind me. We were coming up to the red light fast and I swerved into the right lane while slamming on my brakes. My 10 year old cousin in the back is wailing at this point and honestly I, I felt like I was going to cry too. The man who I now saw clearly looked like he hadn't showered in days. He had something in his left hand too but I didn't see what it was. 
I was frozen in fear, like legit frozen, and I couldn't move. This has never happened to me before too, and all of those horror movies that I saw where the victims just didn't move, they make a lot more sense now. Anyway, he was already getting out of his car and coming straight towards me with his head pressed up on my window. The guy saw my cousin crying in the back and just shouted through the glass, You're lucky there's a kid with you. If she wasn't in the back, both of you bitches would be dead for trying to pull that shit on me. The light goes green and the guy goes back to his truck with what I can now see is a baseball bat and he just drives off. We all just sat there in silence, even with the light green, and I learned a valuable lesson that night. You never know who is behind the wheel of a car and because of that, learn to let it go when someone pisses you off on the road. No horn blaring or middle fingers are worth it, and I guess my only excuse for the last night was just being extremely tired, and I just wanted to get back home in order to get up early to take my cousin to work, her car is in the shop, and take my little cousin to school. We were really lucky that night, and I hope it never happens again. So I'm in high school final year and we actually got an opportunity to go to France on a trip. It was our Duke of Edinburgh assessments. A group of kids my age, we all set up our tents, first day. We figured it would be best to put them in a row too and there's a hedge by our openings and facing the other way there's a few empty lots. A metal fence too, black with straight poles. So beyond that, there was a click or two of long grass, waist height and then a mountain with an old war memorial at the top. We went up to the memorial that day and it was pretty cool. There's a shop and a few rooms full of old guns and clothes and then an old fortress used on the shoreline. I don't remember the exact location but uh, if I do I'll, I'll try and update you guys. So it was getting late and our assessor invited us into his camper for some tea. I remember having hot chocolate too. We went back to our tents, got comfy, chatted with the tents still open, must have been around 1am or so. And then we heard this noise, and I've never heard anything like it, like the way a fox screams, but deeper and bassier. We dismissed it as a fox and carried on chatting, and next minute we heard it again, closer this time. Then the other guy in my tent pokes his head out and whispers loudly, telling us to look quick. And I can only describe what I saw that day as just horrific, and... It honestly makes me feel so weird just thinking about it, and I'm not sure why. Just a, a wrenching feeling, like I know it was bad or something. Anyway, it looked like a, a person, small, hunched over onto all fours, but it was quick. It ran through the fence, and it must have squeezed through the gaps, but it seemed like it just kind of floated through the metal. I don't know, but... It started to sniff around or something, staying by the fence about 30 or 40 feet away, and then it went back through the fence, and you could see it rustling through the long grass that it ran back up towards the hill on. And then, we heard the noise again, but it was different this time. A higher pitch this time, and literally sounded like a person screaming, but it was a lot further away. We honestly didn't know what to think, and we didn't panic, which was surprising, and we all just kind of froze in shock. The next day, we went back up to the memorial, and as we were going for some reason, a French uniformed officer with an armored vest and a cap on comes up to us as we were walking to the entrance. He was armed, a small pistol tucked into a holster on his belt. I know a gun when I see it, and he said that we need to leave, that we aren't allowed in, and that was that. It was really strange, but that was pretty much all that happened. We carried on with our trip and I forgot about it, but thinking back on the whole thing, it's just really weird. So, to start this, I need to tell you guys a little bit of backstory. So my husband and I lived in a big city in a teeny tiny house around 500 square feet or so. We were planning our wedding and starting a family soon, so we couldn't stay there anymore, and, well, I couldn't, but he was okay with it. But 
Anyway, we, we had dreams of moving out into the country and we found such an amazing deal on 320 acres that we just had to go and check it out. We emailed the realtor and she had said that the lady living there wasn't quite ready to show the house yet. She really didn't want to sell so she wasn't sure when she could show it. We asked if we could come and see the land and the house would be fine until we could build our dream home further away from the highway anyway, so we go as excited as ever and we pull up and get out of our truck. All you could hear were these birds in the wind and it was just so peaceful and quiet in comparison to city life. And We knew immediately that this was going to be our home. The realtor arrived and the owner wasn't home so she showed us the house. It was 1300 square feet so it honestly felt like a mansion to us and the lady who owned it was 80 some years old and lived on the property alone. The children actually wanted her to move closer to them for fear of something could happen to her and she would always go out into the field on her quad, not trusty at all, or in some sort of beat up old van. Anyway, inside of a house were these pictures of just saints everywhere. She was Haitian and I got the kind of voodoo vibe but not at all in a, a negative kind of way. So we go to explore the outbuildings and one of them has this chair, a, a ton of burnt out candles and some knives. More voodoo vibes again but not negative. It's a religion and I'm not one to judge what people believe in all that but we ended up meeting the lady and she took us out on her quad to see the land. It stalled a few times. She was really fun and upbeat and she also seemed to like my husband and myself so we made an offer and we actually got the house. We had a bunch of friends help us move November 2016 and I burned sage in the house because that's just something that I do and I never got any bad vibes or anything but I just did it to clear it out for our belongings. I had a friend with me at the time too and she actually said that she saw a shadow move so she also went over to the house with Sage just to be safe. We do know that someone died on the property, cutting trees down apparently so I wanted to be on the safe side too. Another friend of mine got a really creepy vibe that night too. They stayed on the main level bedroom and she said that the entire night had just felt like someone was watching it. On the main level in the original house, there's the bedroom, the kitchen, the living room, and an oversized pantry. And there was an addition on the main level, and it had the dish pit, aka sink, and cupboards, but not enough room for a table. It also had the bathroom and its own little cellar basement. The original basement looks like something out of a dungeon with just giant boulders, and it was completely unfinished. The pillars holding the beams up are trees rather than 4x4s and it's very rustic and honestly, I love it. But it can give off some weird vibes I guess. I'm no stranger to paranormal activity as I grew up in a haunted house but that's another long story but my husband has always been a huge skeptic. The beat up falling apart old barn always creeped me out though. I just never liked it and I always avoided it. Half of the roof was caved in anyway and it looked a little like a, a scene from a horror movie to be honest and it even creeped out my husband a bit. He felt like something was always going to jump out at him when he was fixing things in there. Anyway, so on to the paranormal bits now. So I can't remember really when this started as much as it just happened in the few years we lived there. But it all seemed to begin when I was walking into the living room and passed by the basement stairs. I saw a, a black dog, almost a pit bull shaped I think, sitting at the bottom of the stairs with just red eyes. I did a double take and as soon as I looked back it wasn't there. I went into the basement thinking that it was our big dog, Mastiff Rottweiler Shepherd Lab Cross, but he wasn't there and he was in the dish pit. So I, I tell my husband and I just kind of shake it off. I must admit that I did feel a bit uneasy about it, but I didn't want to make a big deal out of it too. At the next event, I actually have a miscarriage. I'm not sure how long after this. Maybe a few months, I think. So, I'm actually in a pretty dark place. But we also had a falling out with a close friend that ended up being pretty messy and some huge negative family drama with an in-law. The in-law is very verbally abusive and manipulative and all that good stuff. Anyway, uh, a few months later, my husband has to go work a, a job overnight in another province. The first night by myself in the house too, and it was really creepy. 
I just felt so uneasy the entire night and I was so thankful that he was only gone the one night too. It just felt like I, I wasn't alone and my dogs were a little on edge too and it was super windy and stormy out and it was a perfect scene for a horror movie so I just went to bed early and I slept it away. So carry on again and I'm pregnant once more. Our baby boy was growing wonderfully, our two old dogs, Japanese chins, had some crazy dental work done and they weren't happy campers. So they were up all night and my pregnant self was tired and cranky. So I took my Yorkie poo to the main level guest bed to sleep and she was pretty restless. And she kept looking to the corner of the room and then moving to different parts of the bed trying to get comfortable. Always to sit up and look at the corner too. This is the bedroom my friend had just really negative vibes from and so my Yorkie poo started growling at the corner of the room. So we just noped out of there pretty quickly and I suffered a sleepless night with our recovering dogs and it was super dark and you couldn't see anything in the room. And then we had a music festival on our property in June. It was fun and it all kind of related to this in the future. My lovely baby boy decided to be a breech baby and kicked my nerves all the time to the point that I couldn't walk so I started maternity leave early at 36 weeks, due end of July 2018. So I'm home now pretty much all day. But the house felt just so different than just being home on evenings and weekends too. It felt like a, a heaviness was there and I also couldn't go into the basement if it was dark out, only in the daytime and I just got this feeling that something bad would happen if I did. But I constantly felt like I was being watched too and if the small dogs were in our bedroom with the Yorkie poo, they would bark and growl at anyone coming up the stairs, which was a really new behavior for them. And this is when I started getting feelings like I was being followed up the stairs. Anyway, that baby boy was born and he's a night owl so... I'm up a lot in the night, which isn't normal for me. Our top floor is three-quarter story, so there's a storage space where the walls are because at that corner angle of the roof and all that. And in the baby boy's bedroom, there's an opening with no door. I actually feed him in this room so as not to disturb the husband as he's still going to work at this point. And it always feels like something's watching and just waiting in there. I would always avoid looking at it because... I felt like if I did that I would see glowing eyes or something worse and even just walking the hallway between bedrooms is really uncomfortable during these nighttime feedings. And it was at this point that I ended up starting to see this shadow following me which was really creepy and it just defied all of science. I always tried to debunk things that I saw so as not to work myself up into a frenzy but these shadows... They were also just really large and they'd be as tall as the ceiling, 10 foot sometimes, and were disproportionate looking. I would try to recreate the shadows with my steps, but it never worked. And as for the feelings, I always tried to make myself believe that it was in my head, just an overactive imagination, but sometimes knocking would come from the basement too, especially when the internet wasn't working and our modem and router were actually in the basement. And that was always awful because I had to work up a lot of nerve to go and fix the internet as it was my lifeline with our cable. We actually ended up moving the guest bed into the basement at some point and I was going to sleep there one night so I could catch up and my husband was going to feed the baby boy at night so I settled up in the basement, get all comfy and cozy and excited for a good night's sleep. I turn off the lights and there's this green light on the ceiling. It's fading in and out slightly, but in no regular kind of pattern, so I'm thinking that it must be a reflection on the ducting or something like that. I turn on the lights and it's solid wood where the green light was, and there also isn't any green light to cause a reflection. I looked around for quite some time to try and find an explanation for this light, but there was just no reason for it to be there. And at this point... I just kind of noped out of there and I went into our travel trailer on a cold fall night. We also had another festival in September and ended up talking to someone that was there in June. So they're asking me about our other big black dog and I'm like, there's just the one. 
they're dead serious that they saw this big pit bull like dog in the field at both festivals. And this kind of made me feel like I wasn't going crazy and that I actually did see something and reassured me that what I was experiencing was real. But then it made me realize that I'm not crazy and that this is actually happening and it was really scary. When my husband is at work, I'm very isolated and our closest neighbor is a mile away and, and all of our family lives an hour drive away. So I'm a little freaked out with everything going on and I'm talking to local friends and city friends and I actually get in touch with a medium at some point. She got me to text her a photo of the house and she says that the land is bad, the house is bad, the dog is possibly a demon apparently and... She offered to come and help me salt the house for gas money. She actually never charged me for anything too and she never told me why the land is bad and to this day I'm still pretty curious. I also ended up getting a local church group to come and pray through the house but nothing really did anything. But they told me some crazy stories of other houses that they had blessed so the area was apparently pretty haunted or something. So... I'm super unhappy still because my husband is about to leave for 8 weeks and, and I don't want my son growing up in a haunted house like I did. I'm also really uncomfortable about being in the home and about being alone with our little guy. So someone gets me in touch with a shaman and he comes and does his thing and it was actually pretty cool to watch. He finishes up and tells me what he found and there's apparently lots of shadow people and uh, they hide away in space upstairs at the top of the stairs and the bottom too and uh, basically everywhere where I felt like I was being watched and such. Apparently to this guy too, shadow people feed on negative thoughts. Also I, I never explained specifics to him so it was kind of neat that his findings matched my experiences. But the shadow people weren't feeding off of me but apparently rather my husband but I am super sensitive, so I was getting all the bad vibes. The dog was, as he said, 80% gone, and if it wasn't, he would come back. He said the barn was awful, and we should just burn it, and he set up a crystal grid around the property to protect us in the future from negative spirits. I know that this all may seem a bit crazy, but honestly, I was desperate at this point. We also talked about some of my past experiences, too. I actually have quite a few, and we also talked about the previous owner. I feel as though her voodoo was actually used to protect her from what we were experiencing potentially. The shaman was actually lovely, and he gave me some blue corn for storing some of my crystals, and he also gave me some suggestions to help keep my sensitivity at bay. The shaman leaves, and husband comes home, says the house feels lighter, and he couldn't believe it. So fast forward a few months and I'm watching Netflix with my little baby sleeping in my arms and my husband comes and says that I saw something. Now that was a little vague obviously so I pry a bit. Apparently he thought one of our little Japanese chins went into the bathroom. It was apparently a white and small thing that went in there and our chins are black and white so he follows and the bathroom door was closed. He's so baffled being the skeptic that he is so... I text the shaman up and he says that he'll do his thing and get back to me. Anyway, he gets back to us and says that it's nothing to worry about and sometimes I, I feel like things move through the house but it's nothing like what we experienced at the beginning. There's no more shadows, no phantom dogs and I can actually go into the basement at night now. I still don't like going down there at night because it's still a little creepy but my husband isn't so skeptical anymore and he kind of understands now. But boy, it was a wild ride from moving in here to over two years later. At least for now, all is calm in the home, but man, do I hope it stays this way. When I was nine, I went to my friend Casey's birthday party. Casey lived near my grandparents and her family had horses and owned a barn that it was about a 10 minute walk from my grandparents. My parents dropped me and my little brother off at my grandparents. He was staying there while I was at the party and afterwards we would both stay the night at my grandparents. I remember this night very clearly too. 
I remember being excited because it was the first party that I went to without my parents. Casey's party is in the barn and the horses are outside in the fenced up area. There's music and decorations, balloons tied to basically everything and tables with food and gifts and there's a lot of other kids there but none I really know except for Casey and her older sister. Since I didn't really know anyone and Casey was too busy to hang out with me much, I, I felt left out and after a little while of just standing around awkwardly, I, I decided I was ready to leave. It's dark out and it's way out in the country so there are no streetlights or anything. I make it less than halfway to my grandparents before I get scared and I turn back to ask if someone will walk with me. I had only been gone for a few minutes mind you but when I got back everything was just different. There were no kids, no decorations, no food or music, just a, a dark empty barn. Terrified I, I run all the way back to my grandparents as fast as I can and once I get there my grandma is furious with me for being outside. I tried to explain to her how everyone at the party had disappeared and she had no idea what I was talking about. But there was a party. She told me that we were staying at her house so that my parents could have a date night and I even asked Casey and her sister about it the next day and they had no idea what I was talking about. Casey says that her birthday isn't actually for a few weeks. To this day, my family says I must have been sleepwalking and just dreamed the whole thing, but I, I can't accept that. I mean, it felt real. I remember it too clearly. There's just no way that it was just a dream. So basically, I went to a party that never actually happened. So this is an experience that I had two months ago while I was visiting my grandmother. I was outside around a, a couple of metal containers to sort of throw away garbage. The containers are placed around a tall hedge and it's really dark outside. Now the hedge made it so that the space around the containers were even darker than the surrounding area. The containers are also placed so that there's not a lot of space between them and so it's a bit hard to explain but it was crammed and made it difficult to visibly see the entire space at one given time, even with lighting. Because of the darkness, I turn on my phone torch and start dumping trash into the containers. One of the containers that takes plastic was completely full so I still tried to fit as much as I could in it but it was uh, getting a bit difficult. Because it was so full in fact, a, a lid from a plastic container dropped to the ground and rolled to the edge of the container. I bent down to pick it up and then I, I thought that I heard what I can only describe as a, an animal like low growl or hiss. The sound was so audibly low that I first thought that I must have imagined it. I shone my torch around the corner of the container, expecting to see an animal like a raccoon or a stray cat. Yet there was absolutely nothing there. Not a pair of reflecting eyes or anything. I shook the feeling off eventually and just continued loading trash into the container. This continued for another half minute I think until I heard what I can only describe as a, an animal-like scream coming from somewhere very close to me. The sound filled me with so much dread that with shaking hands I just packed up my things and left, not looking back. On my way back, I, I thought that I heard footsteps behind me, but when I stopped and listened, the sound also slowed to a stop, though it kept going for a good half a second each time that I stopped walking and only resumed when I started walking again. I kept looking over my shoulder, but I didn't see anyone or anything there. Since then, I've been googling around for sounds that may sound similar to what I heard, and I haven't found anything yet that comes close to it. It kind of sounded like an animal, but not like an animal too that I've heard before. It didn't sound like a typical cat or dog or anything like that, and looking back I, I don't know why I had such an emotional reaction to the experience. The level of dread that it instilled in me is something I haven't experienced before, and this encounter just left me shaking for hours. It's definitely amongst the most terrifying experiences that I've ever had anyway. But what really freaks me out though is that I just, I didn't see anything at all. 
The encounter could have been explained by some animal, but there was never anything there when I tried to look. Also, the, the footstep phenomenon is something I've encountered before while going to the store, and it seems to only happen around a very specific stretch of road very close to those containers, too. To this day, I, I still don't know what I heard that day, but it shook me up for a long time. A few years back, one of my best friends and business partner was and still is a single dad. His ex-wife was in and out of a mental institution for years and he had sole custody of his two kids, a boy 10 and a girl 14. So my friend had to travel to New York to oversee the multimedia setup for the auto show for the Ford display. I was back at the office with the programmers during the day and would stay with the kids each evening. Their house was a new two-story rental in the woodlands in Texas, and the development was built in a, a heavily wooded area just north of Houston. Weird stuff started happening the first night that I was there too. I was watching TV with the kids, and the den lights would just go off. The light switch was on the other side of the room as well. I went over, and the switch was turned off. At first, I, I thought it was a problem with a breaker or something, or... There was uh, another light switch, but if there was another light switch, then who turned it off? I flipped the switch back on, though, and the lights came back on, and I went back to sit down. The lights went off again, though, and I walked back, and I found that the switch was flipped back down to off. And that actually disturbed me a bit. This went on for a while, too, and I asked the kids if this had happened before, and they told me every now and then that the lights would just go off. So, and now I'm trying to act unconcerned in front of the kids, and suddenly, there was a loud crash in the attic, and I and we went upstairs and opened the attic door to check, and there was nothing in the attic. It was completely empty, and there was just no explanation for what made the loud noise. I'm thinking that there must be somebody else in the house at this point. I mean, their mother had showed up unexpectedly before at their old house, but she was in jail at the time and supposedly didn't even have their address. But things quieted down though and it was eventually time to go to bed. I let the family dog in, a lab, checked all the doors and made sure that they were all locked and then went up to the guest room which was between the kids' bedrooms. I had just turned the bedside lamp off and I was laying down when I saw the silhouette of a boy crouch down between the cable box or the VCR lights on the other side of the room and myself. I thought at first that the sun was getting ready to try and scare me so I turned the bedside lamp on and said gotcha but there was no one there. And then there was another loud crash in the attic. This woke the kids up too and now they were pretty scared. And then, we heard a door slam downstairs. I told them that it was a new house and noises happened, and I also told them that I would sleep in the day bed out in the hallway, and I made my rounds again, and we all went back to bed. When I woke up the next morning, the kids and the dog were all asleep on the floor next to my bed, and I still have more than four nights to go. In Emigrant, Montana, a village-sized town that has roughly 500 people, resides a large ranch house with a main floor, attic, remodeled into a bathroom, and a really ancient basement. It's located just before the Mill Creek Bridge that crosses the Yellowstone River, and it's really large with acres of land. So my grandma and grandpa raised my dad and her sister, Aunt El, and their half-sister there. It was built in the late 1800s or early 1900s and because it was a massive property with a barn, a separate garage, multiple chicken coops and fields for livestock or crops and naturally a, a few ranch hands had died on the property before they moved in. For an idea of what the house looks like, there's a large main floor consisting of two bathrooms, four bedrooms, a laundry room and a huge kitchen. Up the staircase, which is down a lengthy hall from the living room, led up to only one room. I, uh, I think it used to be a, an ordinary attic back in the day or something, but, but when my dad grew up there, it had already been remodeled into a bedroom, and this was my Aunt Elle's bedroom. 
I've talked to Aunt Elle before about her bad experiences in the house, most occurring in her solitary attic as she called it. She told me that she had suffered from just terrible screaming night terrors often and even as a teenager refused to sleep up there and instead slept on a mattress in the living room with my grandma. She once described one of her night terrors to me too and in a dream she was being pinned to a bed in the attic unable to move surrounded by numerous human like figures in red robes. To me this sounded a lot like sleep paralysis but she was thrashing around and screaming in her sleep so it mustn't have been. Aunt Elle was pretty scared after that experience too and my grandma bought a small crucifix for her to wear as a necklace. They were somewhat religious and Catholic and attended a local church but usually just my Aunt Elle and grandma would go. The rest of my family didn't seem to care about religion but while wearing the crucifix she found that the night terrors just stopped, even when sleeping in a haunted room. She said that it actually made a huge difference and that she was finally able to feel almost safe in her room again and everything was better. Now, Aunt Elle doesn't know how, but she actually misplaced the necklace a few years later and almost immediately, her terrible dreams and restless nights came back. It became so bad, in fact, that apparently they had an exorcism, even though... Uh, that might not be the correct term because only certain priests are licensed by the Vatican to perform real exorcisms, I guess, but I'd call this a, a Montana village version of an exorcism. My grandma called on the members of the church, asking for help after she became just increasingly concerned with Aunt Elle's behavior. Among the other strange happenings around the house and property, like cupboards opening, objects moving, strange noises, etc., Many church members came to the house, including the pastor, and some drove from hours away to participate. They all stood in a circle in the living room and held hands, praying and attempting to rid the house of whatever was haunting it and my family. Aunt L says that some people actually even began speaking in tongues. I find that part hard to believe personally, but I love and trust my aunt and I'd like to believe it happened. But anyway... Even with sage burning, crucifixes hung up over doors and a group of devout Catholics holding hands and chanting, these demonic spirits just never left the house. The Montana maid exorcism had failed and there wasn't much my grandma could do and they were not about to leave the house anytime soon so they just tried to live with it. Not long after the exorcism of the house though, my aunt Elle remembered her old crucifix working for her and soon bought another one almost identical to the first one that she wore. And once again, the hauntings and the odd sleep behaviors calmed down until they eventually grew up and moved out. The house was kept in the family though, but everyone went their separate ways and they might have rented the place out for a while or something, through the late 80s and 90s, but I'm not completely sure. Fast forward about 15 years, right before I was born, my dad, mum and older brother, who was only one at the time, got permission from the family to rent the house and moved in to run their horse and glass etching business from home. It was also a beautiful spot to raise kids, right on the Yellowstone with just so much to entertain us. I was born in 1998 and lived in that house for about six years I think. I only have memories though from ages of about four to six in that house I think and my brother was six to eight and has even better memories. My parents told us countless stories after we had moved out and grew older too and we all remembered just how creepy it felt living there and we all agreed that it was definitely haunted. Once I was no longer in my crib, I got my own bed and room and my room was next to the kitchen but my brother's was really far away on the other end of the house. I hated the way my room felt so I played in my brother's room a lot and the main floor was honestly massive and really stretched out like a maze almost, especially for a five-year-old. My parents took the attic room for privacy and my dad told me that shortly after moving in and while I was too young to know what was happening, the night terrors began. My mum was sleeping in the living room on a futon alone at first most nights, which wasn't out of the ordinary because my dad would snore really loud and she just can't sleep through it. She later admitted though that she just couldn't stand the vibe coming from that room anyways. My brother and I always had nightmares and I especially had terrifying ones about the house itself that I'll never forget. 
So we rarely slept in our rooms, which is normal for kids that age, and eventually it got to the point where every night we just slept by our mum on the futon. Our own rooms gave us the creeps, and our parents knew it too, and it never once questioned it. I know my brother and I were not scared to sleep alone, just scared to sleep alone in that house. The whole property just gave off a really creepy feeling, but we felt safe together. My dad did sleep alone, though, in the same attic where his sister experienced a repetitive demonic presence 20 years prior. I know he remembers living in the house as a kid, so I'll never understand why he stayed in that room. Most nights, too, he would get these night terrors and scream so loud that we could hear it downstairs, down the hall, and in the living room. I could tell it scared my mum, too, although she handled it well, and he would scream bloody murder until my mum would go to the attic to wake him up. And this became a routine thing, but never once got less freaky. He actually suffered from extreme insomnia at this house, being too scared to fall asleep eventually, or just couldn't sleep at all, and I remember my dad looking like a zombie to me during this time, probably from being so restless and working a lot too. He didn't take on to the whole religion thing as a kid, and never turned to the church for help or anything. But talking to him later on, however, he admits that it was very haunted. His night terrors usually involved my brother, mum, or myself getting murdered, and he spared me the details most of the time and did never feel comfortable talking about his terrors. And I could tell that it scared him, though. And my mum, who was an atheist, although I was raised Catholic, had her sandblasting machine set up in the creaky, leaky basement that had stairs down from the kitchen and a cellar door outside leading to it as well. The concrete staircase spiraled down and was actually pretty steep. The basement itself was riddled with mice, and I think we even found a feral cat with babies down there at some stage. It honestly looked like an old damn torture chamber with just terrible lighting and mold everywhere. My mother spent countless hours in that basement too, putting designs into glassware and tiles to sell so that she could help my dad support us. She told me that she always had a terrible feeling being down there alone and hated working in the dim light. Often, she would open the cellar door to let light in, but she hardly let my brother or I keep her company while she was working there. Around 2004, we moved out, and the family sold the whole riverfront property for roughly a million dollars to some rich guy who wanted to rent the rooms out for fishermen. Last I checked, though, it has been sold or rented out to some hippie who raises goats or something. I drove by it last week and you can see through the giant glass windows that she has the rooms illuminated with red lights for some reason. My mum also began having sleep paralysis at that house but doesn't get into it much anymore. But my parents divorced in 2014 and she's now engaged to someone else, about to be happily married this March too. But my dad's night terrors continued for years after we moved too but eventually they stopped and his insomnia just never went away and he was restless until the day that he passed away, and it was last weekend at the young age of 50. Now, since I was maybe five, I've been having these routine nightmares, crazy lucid dreams, and just constant sleep paralysis, even though I live away from my family now. And in my own apartment, I've, I've had a handful of pretty terrifying paranormal experiences with my boyfriend. My brother is actually 23 now and takes care of my grandma in the apartment my dad died in and he hasn't had nightmares like he used to, I think. We don't talk about that much anymore because we're both just busy people. My cousin, Aunt El's daughter, recently told me though that she also suffers from sleep paralysis and oddly frightening dreams, although she never lived in the ranch house. They did come visit a lot though when we lived there, so I guess there's that. We're both 20 years old now, and we don't talk either much nowadays, but we always felt a stronger relationship than the other cousins did because we look pretty much identical and sound alike. It's currently 5.20am at this point, and I'm telling this story because my Aunt Elle called me about an hour ago, and this was just really out of character for her because she has a normal 9-to-5 job and thus a, a normal sleep schedule. She doesn't work tomorrow, but it's still a little bit strange. Anyway, she called me to tell me that she actually found her original crucifix which she wore when she had almost lost it 30 years ago in that house. 
She gave it to her daughter and told her to wear it, as Jesus is supposed to protect you from demonic presences, she said, and she also decided to give me her second crucifix, hoping it might protect me from whatever invisible presence might be around me. And to be honest, I plan on never taking it off, as she really wants me to have it too. Please understand that I know millions of people experience sleep paralysis and nightmares every day, and they aren't demonic or spiritual, and even though they feel that way. The scientists can somewhat logically explain why these things happen to us in our sleep with science. However, I don't feel like my family's experiences can be explained completely that way. I was raised without a god to pray to and I've never been religious, in fact doubting the presence of a higher power altogether. I know that this was a pretty long story, but everything that I recall myself and was told by my aunt Elle, my dad, my mum and my brother and my grandma is true. I didn't make any of this up and I did not exaggerate any details intentionally. Keep in mind too that I was very young when I lived there and I totally admit that it's possible my young mind interpreted some events as scarier or different than they actually were. But my dad's night terrors were really scary no matter what age I was. Funnily enough though I, I kind of miss that house. I mean I had my first memories there with plenty of amazing ones to help weigh out the scary ones. Anyway, I never thought that I would share this story here, but uh, I just had to share it with someone, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. My wife and I live in a two-story townhouse and our bedroom is upstairs. Just inside the bedroom door and to the left stands a, an old full-length freestanding mirror. The frame is made of oak and I was given the mirror over 20 years ago now when a friend cleaned out his house. Our bed is in the middle of the room with the mirror being just across the floor from my side. Now one of our dogs sleeps in the bed with us. She's been around the mirror since birth and has never had any issues with it. But at 2.40 this morning I awoke to her growling and just staring at the mirror head and ears up. I reached down and tapped her butt and just told her to stop but she remained rigid but lowered her head a bit and continued staring directly into the mirror. Within a minute she began growling again and then very slowly advancing toward the mirror on her belly with her growls now ending in barks. At the time a, a thousand things were running through my mind like is it an intruder, something worse but the growling in the barks just became louder and louder until she stood up, stepped down off the bed and walked cautiously over to the mirror about three or four feet from it and then laid down on her stomach with her front legs extended and her head pointing directly toward the mirror. She remained in that position growling with the occasional bark as I was getting out of bed and I immediately turned on the lights and everything seemed okay. I noted the time was now 3.01am and she followed me downstairs and she didn't want food or water or potty and not even a treat. So we eventually just walked back upstairs and the time was now 10 after 3. She watched as I checked out the mirror and I tilted it, shook it, viewed it from her angle and there was nothing and she seemed okay now. So I, I turned off the lights and I got back under the covers and she hopped back onto the bed in her usual spot, pointed toward the mirror and I stayed awake for about 20ish minutes just listening to the sounds of the house at the night and the rest of the night was uneventful. When I woke up this morning and I went downstairs to get a coffee, I noticed that both of the laundry room doors, they were wide open. And I know for a fact that those doors, they were closed at 3am. So, first let me set up some background to make the flow of the story smoother. But this happened almost 19 years ago too. So I was nearly 13 years old and I was being raised by my grandparents. We lived in a, a tourist town in Florida. They had problems with their two daughters as adults, my mother being the older of the two, and they wanted to do everything that they could to make sure that I didn't turn out the same way. A do-over, if you will. So, needless to say, they were very strict. My aunt was having a good period at the time. She kind of got her stuff together and we were all pretty close. 
My aunt also understood what it was like to be raised under a glass dome, metaphorically speaking, and so, being as she was my only aunt, she made sure that the time we spent together was really cool. I would stay over Saturday nights, and we'd go out and hang out at the pier, and she'd let me hang out with my middle school boyfriend, who would find ways to get to wherever I was. Now, my grandparents had no idea of any of these activities, of course. I was just spending some quality time with my aunt and giving them a break. It was actually nice that I had a younger female figure since my mum wasn't around, and one night, when we were out having fun, my aunt meets this guy, and they really hit it off. He was really nice and introduced himself to me. He went by JR and at first was kind of charming and a bit of a talker. They exchanged numbers after hanging out a while and when we went home we went to bed. They ended up going out a bit more too and my aunt had really liked JR. He took her to his home and introduced her to his father and showed her around his land and he lived out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. I've lived in this town for 30 years, and I still to this day couldn't tell you exactly where it is. I was only there once, and he was teaching my aunt how to shoot a gun. I remember her shoulder rocking back with the impact of the shot, and it surprising her, and he had those uh, those weird flamenco dancing clothes in his closet. It was all seemingly harmless, and I mean, everyone has their quirks, right? Well, about 10 days, maybe two weeks later... We were again at the pier out by the payphones, just talking about what to do that night and what to get for dinner and whatnot. JR and my aunt were in their late 20s, early 30s, and as much as she loved me, I I imagine that there were times that I kind of got in the way. Anyway, we're at the pier and he's talking about how he has these painkillers. He offered me one and I declined of course and I told him that I had a high tolerance to pain anyway and didn't need that stuff. He then, with a huge smile, asks if he can see for himself, assuring that he won't really hurt me, he's just trying to have some fun. And this guy twists my arm behind my back until I hear a pop. I start to cry and he laughs and says, Oh sweetheart, I was only playing, you said you had a high tolerance, I guess I was stronger than I thought I was being, I'm sorry but there's no need to ruin the good time that we're all having. I go into the private peer office, which my granddad managed, crying obviously, and my aunt comes in and lets me know that she thinks it's pretty messed up too and that she's talked to him about it. She goes back outside and he asks her what she's up to that night. She tells him that she isn't sure if I'm staying over because with what had just happened and all that. I was whining about going home and honestly, I was pissed that she hadn't decked him right there for hurting me. And well... He tells her that she should meet him under the Sunset Bridge at 2am on the other side of town. He says that the stars are really beautiful there and you can listen and hear the fish. He tells her that he would love to see it with her and that they can dance under the moon and whatnot. We were all from a fishing family and live in a fishing town, so fish activities under the bridge at late times wasn't necessarily something that threw up a red flag or anything. If it's dark and late, there won't be people there hogging on the fish. So, she tells him maybe, and we leave. I decide to spend the night after all, later sneaking in, only if she'll pick up my boyfriend Charlie, playing up on the guilt points. She calls him when she gets home, before we made our arrangement about Charlie, and says that she can come, but she'll have me with her. He groans, and he's like, fine, alright, I guess she can come too, and maybe she'll get tired and sleep in the car. About an hour after she called him, the first time I asked her about Charlie, she agrees. She sits down with me and hugs me and touches my face lovingly, apologizing for what had happened with my arm, and she then calls him again and tells him to not worry, she's picking up Charlie, so I'll have my own entertainment and they can have their time. But then, he goes into a rage and starts sputtering and cussing about how it's too complicated now, and he just wanted an intimate meeting with her and not a damn family reunion. He went on about how he he didn't want to have to babysit a 13-year-old kid and her 14-year-old boyfriend. And he hangs up after calling her a crazy bitch. She bewilderingly hangs up the phone and tells me what happened. We go about our night with pizza rolls and PlayStation and things are fine. He calls her a few more times and drives by the house for a couple of weeks, but my aunt was pretty much having none of it. And after a while, he left our lives just as swiftly as he'd come. 
The whole affair lasted only a month, if even that, and three weeks maybe, I think, and all in all, it wasn't the craziest experience she had with a man. But JR was soon forgotten about, and we went about our business. Flash forward about two years later, and I'm almost out of middle school now. My aunt had moved to a city about 40 miles away and I still lived with my grandparents. They were still strict, but as they had gotten older, so had I. In other words, I knew a few ways around the rules. Now one day, my friend Frank and I missed the bus home from school and called our good high school friend Darla to pick us up and take us home after riding a bit. She had this big, beautiful red truck and I would ride around in the cab of it, loving the freedom and the wind. We were smoking cigarettes and laughing and just listening to the radio. The time I would have spent on the bus before my stop was just enough time too to hit up the taco drive through and we cruised down the road a bit before heading back to Frank and I's house. We had a lot of fun that day and she dropped me off first. My grandparents came outside and they were heavily confused at the sight of an unknown vehicle and even more so when they saw that I had gotten out of it. After letting her be the one to explain because she was older, cooler and more responsible, my parents thanked her for being kind enough to take me home. They said how lucky I was that she had just happened to be there to help me get home. The things we do to our parents, eh? (laughs) Anyway, that was the last time we ever saw my friend. She didn't show up for work for five days and I can't speak for everyone, but I assume that she'd just run away or something. Dala's parents were going through a nasty divorce at the time and the dad had a hot new girlfriend and the mother was very bitter about it. Rightfully so, I guess, but it was embarrassing for all of the kids. Her truck wasn't left behind though and I figured that she just got tired of her parents acting like infants and just took off. I missed her, but she was in a whole other league of freedom and coolness. 16 is just a, a whole different life than 14, especially when you're in different schools so I I wished her well and maybe even a little envious that she got out of this town and I was still here. I hadn't heard anything for two weeks about her when at about nine at night my grandparents got a phone call to turn on the news because apparently Darla's body was found out in the woods. She'd been strangled to death and just left out there and I don't even know for how long. Obviously I was devastated. I was really joyful that I had that last experience with her, but just really saddened and horrified. I mean, she was so young, barely older than myself. She was about to be 17 in just a short time, and it was a really sad time for our town. The good and bad news is that they caught the guy that had done it. He confessed after some very incriminating evidence, and during his questioning, also confessed to killing his girlfriend, who had been missing for about eight years, and also his father, staging his death to look like a suicide by hanging. When they showed his mugshot on the screen and said his name, I swear that I almost passed out. Because there, clear as day on the screen, staring back at me, was a picture of JR. Now... I had no idea that they even knew each other. I can't even imagine what would have happened if we had gone under the bridge that night. Investigation Discovery Channel did a piece on it a couple of years back and I was shocked to see it on TV. The memories came rushing back and I decided to write them all down and I literally have found a newfound appreciation of life now that I'm old enough to understand just how close I could have been to being killed that night. I have a beautiful life with my husband three boys that most likely wouldn't have happened if things had gone differently that night. A little over a year ago, I had a job working overnight at a gas station close to my house. I'm a woman and was 31 at the time. I know that to some it's going to seem unsafe for a woman to work graveyard shift by herself, but it was a slow store and the sheriff's office was about 20 feet across from it. Honestly, I, I really didn't think that I would have that many problems. And I mean, there would be about 30 customers in an 8 hour shift and that was uh, on a busier night too. Anyway, it was about 3.30 in the morning and I went outside to sweep the parking and last minute check the trash and all that. 
It was time for a cigarette and I had one headphone in kind of jamming out. Across the road in the parking lot of the sheriff's office I I saw a figure with his back to me. He was swaying back and forth while looking down and honestly it uh, looked like he was enjoying a much needed piss or something. But against the sheriff's office though? Yeah, the building closes at 4pm and doesn't open again until 6 the next morning, but why? By the back of his ripped white t-shirt, I, I remembered that he had come in about four hours earlier. He was a total creep and I could already tell that he had a good buzz going. I didn't say anything and I just took my eyes off of him and tried not to draw attention to myself. And it was working until a car pulled in. I was still outside as they pulled up and I saw him look at the car and then at me and back and forth again. As the customer is leaving, I walked her outside and... I still had half a smoke burning and had left my dustpan outside with the squeegee. We both heard him start to swear angrily and seemingly engage in an argument with himself and she looked across the road and told me to be careful. I made an awkward joke about him being the one who should be more afraid of me or something like that. The man was still there but closer to the road now, facing the parking lot of my store. But whatever he was yelling was completely unintelligible too. He was obviously very drunk and could barely stand straight, still swaying away. I didn't engage him, but I didn't take my eyes off of him at this time too. I just kind of slowly walked back into the store and something about his face just really bothered me. It had a, a darkness to it, but his eyes just looked wild. My experience during graveyard jobs has been that crazy-eyed ones are the worst ones. I didn't like it at all and I wanted no part of it and I still had almost three hours to go and two before any other employees got there. So instantly, I went to the computer and typed up a temporarily closed sign just in case he wanted trouble. I was coming around the counter on my way to the doors when I saw that he'd walked across the road to my side now. I literally just barely got the second door locked when he stumbled into a very small parking lot. My hand makes the mimed hand signal for cut across my neck, basically saying, no, sorry, you can't come in here, we're closed. And I shook my head back and forth too, hoping to further discourage him. He started walking away, but screamed something at me while he's walking. And I don't mean that he was grumpy and shouted at me or yelled that I was an asshole or anything. I, I mean, like, he was at an enraged volume and was violently throwing his hands just everywhere. Definitely knowing that I'm in the wrong shift of the wrong job, I, I got really skeeved out at that point. I decided to call the cops at this point, and it's a good thing too, because the minute that I hung up with them, there he comes again up to the door, and he starts pulling and banging on it, and he backs up and runs into it, trying to ram it. Not that it would have done any good, but I made the mistake of telling him that I'd called the cops and his ass was about to be grass, and... I say that I made the mistake of telling him because once I said that, he took off. The police never did find him too and they drove around the road and surrounding neighborhoods for over an hour but basically found no one. He was on foot too so I don't get where he could have gone. He didn't harm me and with them not finding him I, I didn't fill out a police report or anything and I was safe behind thick glass doors that were locked for the rest of my shift. The whole situation just really sucked and maybe if I didn't warn him ahead of time I, I wouldn't have had to have spent the last three months of my job just constantly looking over my shoulder. I'll never really know what the right choice was but I'm just glad that I don't work there anymore. So I was a janitor for a little bit a while ago in a building that was only accessible by a key fob. You'd need one to get into the front door and you'd have to use it again to enter the offices too. Now, the shift was from uh, about 4pm to midnight and if I finished early, I got to leave while still being paid until midnight. Each night I'd hang out with my co-workers in the office until 5pm and then we'd all head out to our buildings. I'd empty all the trash bins first, vacuum and what we needed, take care of any scheduled cleanings like uh, steam cleaning the curtains and whatnot, and might hit the bathrooms last since everyone would normally be out of the office at that time. 
Now most nights, I was finished between 8pm and 9pm, and there was a night when I was finishing up and all I had to do was clean the bathrooms. I did the women's bathroom without any issues, and then I headed into the men's bathroom, and when I went in, the lights turned on because of that sensor thing, and there, standing in the middle, was a, a man that I had never seen before, just standing there in the middle of the bathroom, dead still. He had his head down in a weird way, and I have no idea who he was or how long he was in there, but he had to have stood still long enough for the lights not to go off. And then, he must have remained motionless so that they wouldn't turn back on. And when I saw him, I just turned around and I left for the night. This happened about four years ago at my then girlfriend's house. She lives in the sticks of NC with the neighbours on either side about a, a half a mile away. Her parents and older brother were home at the time and for context, we were both 15. It was around 11pm on a Saturday and a car pulled up in the driveway and the headlights shined through my girlfriend's bedroom window and we heard a car door shut. My girlfriend and I figured it was a family friend or someone who was coming to hang out and drink with her parents or something and we honestly didn't pay it much mind. About 10 minutes later, my ex's father comes into the room looking pretty frantic. He tells us to lock the windows and to grab a gun just to be safe. We walk out of the front door and we sat with her mum and brother in the kitchen. Her dad comes back around two minutes later and walks into his bedroom, comes out with a handgun and walks out the front door again. We honestly had no idea what was going on, but soon we heard her dad yelling and then he walks back inside saying that he took care of the situation. He told us that there was a car parked in the driveway with the headlights off and a person in the driver's seat. He said that he reached for the door handle but the person looked up and whipped in reverse out of the driveway. However, he thought that there was still someone in the woods because of the car door that we heard so he walked back outside with a flashlight and his gun. When he came back in, he told us to lock everything and for all of us to stay in one room. He said that he was walking around the house and he shined his flashlight into the woods and there was a trail of reflectors that were stuck to trees leading from the road to the house and he fired his gun a few times to hopefully scare them away. Thankfully, nothing else happened but it was a nerve-wracking experience nonetheless. But was this someone planning on robbing us or murdering us or something? We had no idea but I'm glad that well, we didn't have to find out. We obviously all sat and slept in the living room together that night and I left the next day. I also forgot to mention that the reflector things, they were actually screwed into the tree so this was definitely premeditated. Her father actually left them up for the night but took them down the next morning and the whole situation was eerily weird. This happened back when I was 17 and living in a small rural village. I'd been in a friend's all evening just watching films and chilling and I left to go home at around 11pm. It was quite a long walk back to mine as she lived on the outskirts of the village down some back roads and I felt relatively safe as when it got to a certain time of the night it was pretty quiet here. Honestly you wouldn't bump into anybody and there would hardly be any cars on the roads especially at that late hour and it was weirdly peaceful. Where I lived was a large avenue too, with two big blocks of houses, like the two big circles that you would get to after following a small dark road that consisted of a few large old houses. So, as I'm walking, I see this little beat-up Nissan Micra coming towards me, and the closer it gets, the more it slows down, and the guy is nearly breaking his neck trying to look at me. I mean that there was nothing subtle about it at all and he nearly came to a stop as it drew alongside me and I started to panic. There was not another soul about, just me and this strange guy and I was determined not to get myself in a tiz so I picked up the pace and refused to look at him and as far as I knew he, he drove off. I continued walking home which was literally a five minute straight line from there and I kept listening out for a car engine and was vigilant of any headlights just creeping up behind me or anything. I didn't hear anything and I didn't see anything so I breathed a sigh of relief as I could now see my house. 
I walked in and locked the door and I saw my mum stood in the living room just chatting on the phone. I'm trying to interrupt her conversation telling her about the weird guy in the red car when, for some reason, she goes to the front window and peeks through the curtain and she takes the phone from her ear and says, What, that car? This was all in a minute since walking through the door and I'm thinking to myself, it can't be him because if he had followed me, I would have seen or heard his car for sure. But before I get a chance to look for myself, there's a knock at the front door, so... I go and answer it, only pulling it open a few inches, and there's this guy stood there, empty-handed, wearing like a, a baseball cap. And it was definitely the same guy from the car, and I'm just like, what the hell? I say, can I help you? And he says, did you order pizza? And I'm like, no, I, I think you have the wrong house. Taking a step towards me, he says again in a not messing around kind of tone, no. I said, did you order a pizza? And before I reply, my mum has come up behind me, opening the door fully and says, is there a problem? This causes him to back up, mumbling, I must have the wrong address before he just gets in his car and takes off. Needless to say, we were both a bit spooked out by this and we made sure everything was locked up properly for the next few weeks. A few months ago, I responded to an Instagram ad for a girl that was new in town and needed someone to watch her dog while she went on a trip. I didn't know her well, and just that she was extremely spiritual and maintained a, an Akashic record practitioner business or something. I'm still not quite sure what that certification or business title means, but we've since become friends. So, it was a great dog sitting gig. The dog was really intelligent and sweet, and her house, though small, and a little out of the way in the countryside. Well, it was cozy and relaxing, and complete with all of the spiritual supplies, crystals, sage sticks, candles, all that sort of stuff. And the backyard had a, a hammock and string lights and crickets chirping in the evening, and quite honestly, it was really peaceful and beautiful. The whole gig was supposed to be a nice getaway for me, but I was wary because I knew the chick dabbled in lots of uh, spiritual things, and in the back of my mind, I worried what type of energy she might be letting into her space. And there was definitely something spooky about it too. Like, for instance, when we met at the house to discuss details, she looked overhead suddenly and sighed deeply. And when I looked up, I saw an open-winged hawk gliding closely to us through the pine tree landscape and it was a majestic sight and as we stood there silently, it felt as if we were meant to be there. Not in a romantic sense, but kind of in an eerie one. It was as if time just kind of stood still or something. Anyway, the energy of her house seemed to come alive at night and each time nightfall came, feelings of just unease crept up on me. I obviously pushed those feelings out of my head and attributed the spooky feeling to the fact that there was no TV in the house, so maybe it was just really quiet and I just wasn't used to it. I had been there alone for a week and had a responsibility to be there for this dog, so no room to get scared, right? Well, towards the end of my stay, I was sitting up on the couch one evening and I felt something touch my right arm just a soft poke in the space between my shoulder and elbow. I looked at my arm, looking behind me, and I glanced all around the room looking for some sort of logical explanation, and I told myself that it must have just been a draft from the fan or something. It totally wasn't, but again, I, I didn't want to be scared, and I didn't know what to think. I finished my beer, and I went to bed eventually, and in the following weeks, I told the story to my friends and a few of my sisters, but never mentioned it to the lady that I was sitting for. I'm not sure why, I, I guess I just didn't want her to be offended or something. However, she ended up moving out of that house and back to her home state of Vermont, so I finally decided to reach out and pry a little bit. I asked her if she ever felt anything spooky in the house, and that was pretty much it. But keep in mind too that I had told her nothing of what I had experienced. And here's her response. She told me that, yes, especially at night, it would start to feel really eerie and sometimes I would feel a hand on my right shoulder. 
It used to scare me so bad that I would run to bed and hide under the covers, but then I started to look at it as a a hand guiding me through the darkness. After she told me this, I, I told her all about my experience about feeling something touch my right arm. And she said, yes, I'm quite certain that it was the same with a really weird and kind of joyful little giggle. Obviously, I never went back to that place and after some time, I lost touch with that woman too. So I was around 12 when I got in a babysitting job with a family across town. This family was new to the area and just recently bought the house next to my best friend's place. My first day over was to just kind of get familiar with the kids in the house and whatnot. The parents stayed and evaluated me and of course I answered any questions and I spent my time playing and keeping the children occupied and there was a boy named Devon, age 4, and a girl named Cameron, age 7. So obviously I, I had my work cut out for me. Cameron wanted me to go to her room so that she could show me her toys and I followed her up the two flights of stairs but... As we came to the top of the stairs, I felt strangely lightheaded and the hair on my arms just rose up. I just had a, an intense feeling of being watched, like there was someone else up there with us. I tried to ignore the sensation and continue with my duties of finding Cameron's favorite doll so that we could go back downstairs and at the end of the day it was decided that I was a good match and I was to come back on Saturday morning. But as I headed home, I I just couldn't shake the feeling that I got from that upstairs section. I told myself that eh, it must be nothing and I brushed it off to just being a new place and unfamiliar surroundings. So Saturday morning rolls around and I show up to a busy home as the parents tried to get out the door and show me the last minute things that I needed for the day ahead. The kids were up in their PJs just eating breakfast and already talking to me about all the fun things that they wanted to do today. After the parents left, I ushered the kids off to get changed. As I was cleaning up the breakfast dishes, I I heard a loud bang coming from the dining room. I ran into the room and found one of the false ceiling tiles had fallen from its place. Puzzled, I tried to put it back up, but it wasn't an easy task and after some struggling, I managed to fit it back in and I thought to myself, how could it have fallen out by itself like that? Anyway, the day went on and now it's close to lunchtime and the kids are watching TV and I'm in the kitchen making something for lunch when I hear a a loud bang coming from the dining area again and I look and sure enough, that tile's come out again. This time, I I left it for the parents to see when they get home. Maybe they can fix it, I thought. Now, the kids wanted to play hide and seek, so we started off with Cameron seeking and myself and Devon hiding. As Cameron started to count, we scurried around trying to find the best hiding place and I found the downstairs bathroom to be the best place for me. It was easy enough for Cameron to find me and I hid Devon close to me so that I could keep an eye on him. As I entered the bathroom, I closed the door quietly behind me and I walked a few steps into the room and was now facing the mirror. As I was looking to my reflection, I also noticed something behind me moving. It was the the closet door directly behind me and it was slowly opening. The closet door opened halfway and then just slowly closed again on its own. And I had the same feeling come over me like I had when I was upstairs on the first day. Wide-eyed with fear, I, I turned to the bathroom door and just ran out of there and all I could think of was, what the hell just happened? I was really starting to worry that this house was haunted and I now had every horror movie that I'd ever watched playing through my head. And now I'm I'm finding it really uncomfortable, but I decided it's best to just keep occupied, so I break out a board game for us to play on the living room floor. I think it was Hungry Hippo or something. We were playing for around 20 minutes before I noticed something out of the corner of my eye moving again. I turned my head to see what it was and it's a a child's shoe just tumbling across the floor all by itself. The kids stopped and we all just watched in confusion and honestly, I was in disbelief. Cameron let out a scream and she just ran for the door and at this point, I grabbed up Devon and I just followed her. 
We went to my friend's house next door and we told her mum everything and I'm not sure if she believed me but we stayed over there until the parents got home. When they showed up we told them what we saw and I don't think they believed me either but I showed the panel that fell out and apparently it's been an issue since they moved in. And as for the rest of my accounts, they just chalked it up to a, an overactive imagination. But I know what I saw and what I felt, and I know that I wasn't imagining things. I later found out a bit of history of the house, and apparently a man died in that house of a heart attack, upstairs, in a room above the dining room where the panel kept falling out. This actually happened to me just last night and I'm still pretty shaken up by the experience and I promptly quit this terrible part-time job right after it. So I work at a retail store in a not so nice part of town. Since the area isn't the best, not many people ever come into the store and even less people come in at night. Something important to note too is that the store doesn't have any cameras nor does it have a panic button. So basically, anyone could do anything and we've had many people steal little things here and there and looking back, this should have been my first clue to just quit ASAP. Working this night shift was me, a very small girl, and my co-worker, basically the exact same height and build as me. But we were joking around and just playing on our phones because it was about 7.30pm at this point and no one had come in for about an hour and suddenly... A group of people, two men and one woman, come in all at once. A side note about these people too is that they were all wearing black head to toe, facial tattoos and were very very confrontational upon arrival. But the woman was a, a very husky woman and I was honestly very intimidated by her. Her friends, the two men, were at least six foot each, towering over both me and my co-worker who were both 5'3". One of the men immediately asks us what our ages were and complimented me on my smile. I'm kind of awkwardly laughing and trying to be as kind as possible to get these people to leave fast. But the woman, she basically corners my co-worker over in one of the aisles so she's unable to walk over to where I am which is right behind the counter. The woman is basically yelling at my co-worker, asking her, why don't you hire me, I need to work, hire me and pretty much scaring the crap out of both of us. While this is going on too, one of the men walks over and blocks the door, and the other man comes up to the counter and looks at all the $100 and $300 items we've stocked behind the counter and jokes to his friend about how he needs all of these items. He then turns to me and says with a deadpan face, give me everything. I awkwardly laugh at first and say, everything? And then he says nothing and just continues to stare right into my face for five more seconds before repeating everything. And so I, I just do that. And I start to take things off the shelves while he points to things saying, give me this, give me that and that. And then he just stops and says, you never asked me how I was going to pay for any of this. The entire time his friends are just saying nothing and standing still while just staring at me. The man then breaks his stare and laughs, prompting all of his buddies to laugh along with him and states that they're going to come back. And as soon as they leave, I make a beeline to the door and I lock it. I call my manager and tell her what happened and I'm just begging her to let us close because I do not want these people to come back. And as if on cue, they come back and yank on the door which is locked and continue to try and get in. I tell my co-worker to run with me to the back and we lock the back room door and call the police. By the time the police arrive, they're gone and nothing could be done because of the lack of any cameras in the store. The police did stay outside the store in their cars until we closed and actually walked me to my car which was nice of them. But throughout this whole ordeal, no one was in the store besides me and my co-worker too. And my theory was that they were scoping out the situation before leaving and coming back with a firearm to actually carry out the robbery. Luckily, I had locked the door the moment they stepped out and I don't like to think about what could have happened if I had brushed it off and just decided to leave the store open. But I was shaking like a leaf when they left and I know they hadn't done really anything at all but I trusted my gut feeling and it was a good decision in the end. So anyway... 
I left the job soon after that because, well, money wasn't worth it. I remember this rather clearly, even though I was young. I was on a field trip to a popular public park with my daycare. It wasn't unusual for adults to go to this park by themselves and it was super decked out. There was a train, vendors, sometimes concerts or clowns, so it wasn't only a playground. Anyway, I was always the awkward kid so I wasn't playing with the other daycare kids and instead I was sitting quietly off to the side just daydreaming as I often opted to do. And this made me an easy target since I was just chilling solo. There were others around and I wasn't completely secluded but I was just off doing my own thing. So my mum had talked to me about stranger danger before but I had it in my head that strangers were scary so I actually didn't know what a stranger really was at the time. I just knew that they were bad people. And this woman walked up to me with a camera in her hands. She complimented my t-shirt which had a cat photo on the front and told me that she worked for a cat magazine and thought that it would be a good model for it. Naturally, I was totally down for the prospect. My daycare teachers and the other kids didn't notice that I was talking to a random woman and she asked me questions like my address, where my mum works, my mother's phone number, my social security. I couldn't really answer most of her questions because, I mean, I was just four years old. But it didn't deter her. She got my name and my age and everything I did know I told her when she asked me and she was super nice I remember and after I answered her questions she took a picture of me. After the picture was taken she said that she needed to go to a car to grab something. I can't recall what or why I had to go with her according to her story but I got up and I just went with her. I remember holding her hand and she was literally unlocking her van when my daycare teacher came running through the parking lot and screaming at her, like bloody murder screaming, get the hell away from her, I'm calling the police, help she's kidnapping my kid, the whole nine yards. The woman seemingly forgot about me at this point because she just hopped back into her car and drove off in a snap, leaving me right behind. I remember that I was actually pretty upset at my daycare teacher because I probably wouldn't be in the cat magazine after she'd scared her off. I was crying and the daycare lady was consoling me saying that it was okay, she left, I'm safe, but I was crying because I couldn't be in her magazine. My mum picked me up and took me to the police station where I was asked all about the incident and they never caught it to my knowledge. Like, I didn't know her name or anything really so I'm not sure what they were going to get her on but... I remember my mum was irritated because the best that I could do for her description was long brown hair and jeans. And that's my story of how I was almost kidnapped. So at the start of the year, we were all introduced to our teachers. All of them were pretty good teachers too. Except for Mrs. C. So... We went through our classes and each time we went to one we had to go through those cheesy beginnings of the year introductions and it was quickly clear that her class wouldn't be a normal health class as evidenced by the fact that during her introduction she went off about how terrible her divorced husband was. Classes started picking up and her insecurity somehow kept making it into lectures too and one day a few weeks into school she just stopped showing up to class you know, her job, consistently. Now, at this point, everyone was cutting her some slack because she was a single mum, but it just got worse. We would have to do whole units from a workbook with improvised substitutes who were actually most of the time school staff with no idea what they were doing. And this culminated when Mrs. C missed two weeks of school for just no apparent reason. Most of the class could see her mental deterioration and me and some friends in class started noticing some form of uh, distress from Mrs. C too. More and more stuff about her personal life would leak into lectures that she was there for. And suddenly, it just all came to a head. She suddenly just became distant and developed a really tough shell around her. Mrs. C actually started coming to class consistently too and she started bringing her kids, closer to toddlers but still, to class. I have a hunch that she started doing this to help justify her inaction to her employers and 
One day, she just sort of broke down in class about how horrible her husband was and was not taking equal responsibility for her kids and all that. It was a bad joke at this point. I mean, how long would Mrs. C last before she just got fired? Unluckily for us, it was too long. We just sort of endured lectures from this really mentally unstable woman for quite some time. Mind you, she was doing a fine job at suppressing traits associated with what was going on around other school employees. So one day, we come in and she just wasn't in class, breaking her streak of actually coming. And we finally got our answer of just how long she was going to last. A counsellor walked into the room and everyone knew what was up. She was gone. But what had gone down exactly? Well, apparently... She walked into her ex-husband's house on the Sunday before the class period. Her excuse to her ex was to deliver cold medication to her kids and after threatening to call the cops after her home invasion, she locked herself in the bathroom. She called the cops and unlocked the door to the bathroom and she then walked over to her coat, pulled out a gun and opened fire on her ex's girlfriend, killing her. And Mrs. C then pinned everyone into the house until the cops showed up and, and that wasn't her first offence either. This obviously all occurred suspiciously close to the time when she hardly showed up to a job and she apparently had several assault charges against her that she somehow managed to keep secret to her job as a teacher. Weirdly enough too, the students who didn't have her as a teacher didn't really take it seriously and it took less than 30 minutes after that info was made public to the students in general for them to just make a meme page about the incident. It was weird how that worked, and anyway, it, uh, it got taken down. So I have lots of creepy encounters during my travels, but uh, I'll start with the most recent one. So this is fairly long, as I had two creepy encounters, one right after the other. But for clarification too, I'm Asian with distinct Asian features, 5 foot 1 inch small, and I'm in my 20s. So last year, I went to Egypt with a big group of 40. But for one night, we stayed at this beautiful villa-style hotel on the top of the mountains too. The layout for this particular hotel is that there's a very long pool in the middle surrounded by small villas with about 20 rooms per villa, I think. Our group got assigned to the farthest villa from the lobby. It was around 10pm too, and I decided to go out for a walk to watch the stars and all that. My grandma, who I was sharing the room with, was tired and went to sleep early, so I went out by myself. I walked around the pool and enjoyed the weather and the stars, and I sat on one of the benches by the poolside. And it was then that I noticed one of the hotel staff, a bag porter who helped with our luggages when we checked in, was approaching me. I didn't think anything of it, but he came by and made small conversation. I brushed it off as he was just trying to be friendly and courteous to guests. He asked questions like where we came from and I answered politely. But what he said next, it gave me the creeps. So he said that his friend was actually looking for a wife from my country. And I was like, uh, okay dude. But I laughed it off and lied that I was married. He asked where my husband was and I kind of panicked and told him my non-existent husband got left behind because he had work. He took out his phone and called someone, but I guess the person he was calling just wasn't picking up. He told me to wait, but my spidey senses were tingling on overdrive at this point, and I had two options. To walk back to the villa as quickly as possible, but I risk letting this man know the room where I'm staying at with my grandma. Or walk towards the well-lighted lobby, hoping that there are people from my group still there. I stood up, and I decided to start walking fast to the lobby. The man was still trying to call someone on his phone and tried to call after me, but I waved goodbye hurriedly. When I got to the lobby, I was relieved to see our tour leader, our Egyptian tour guide, and probably three ladies from our group still there. And no more creepy hotel staff, or so I thought. In the hotel lobby, they have a bunch of these souvenir shops set up, and one of the ladies I was close with, B, was browsing inside the Papra souvenir shop. Our guide warned us beforehand that the papyrus painting that they sell at this hotel, it's definitely fake or, or just generally low quality tourist trap souvenirs. So I, I went into the shop to tell B about that in case she forgot. Inside the shop was B, me and two salesmen. 
one of them was standing near the door and blocking the only means of exit. We asked for my opinion between two paintings and the sailman standing in front of us told us that these paintings have a different pattern shown up that glows in the dark. He asked us if we wanted to see it and I firmly said no before B could answer and I had enough for the day and I just wanted to go back to our room. However, this persistent salesman said something to this other man standing behind us who then proceeded to close the door and the light switch. And oh boy, was that creepy. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but I don't like the idea of being in a pitch dark room with two men that I do not know. I could also sense that B was starting to panic and she held onto my wrist. And like an angel in disguise, the door suddenly opened from outside and it was B's aunt, who was also in the lobby with our tour guide, who shouted at us and asked what we were doing. She motioned for us to come quickly and I swear that... I do not know what would have happened if B's aunt didn't open the door at that time. She made a fuss over it and the rest of the group walked back to the villa together with our tour leader and on the way to the villa, B's aunt asked us if anything happened and if our phones and wallets were still with us and all that. We checked our belongings and everything seemed fine and no one followed us back to the villa and I was so happy that we were also checking out the next morning. Perhaps the creepiest thing though was that when the light flooded the room after my friend's aunt came in, those two men who were in the room, they seemed to be approaching us slowly. Like they were a fair distance away when the light was turned off but by the time that the door was opened, they were much closer to us. I don't know if the other guy with the phone had anything to do with this but the whole thing was just eerily coincidental and really creepy. I was traveling alone through a foreign country at the age of 21. I'm a young female and people often mistake me for being in high school and was told that it would be too dangerous to do this but I did it anyways. My favorite part of traveling alone is just sitting in parks and I buy a snack from the bakery and I have a good book with me and I find a nice shady hidden area to just enjoy for hours. On this day I was at the central park in the center of the city and it was a gorgeous day and the park was covered in bright flower bushes and it made it easy to just find a place where not many people could see me. About an hour in I saw two men whispering out of the corner of my eye and they kept glancing towards me and talking in hushed tones. After about 10 minutes they approached me too. One of the men took out a wallet type thing and opened it very quickly to show a police badge and some sort of identity card but I didn't have time to see if the man's face matched it. He told me that there were policemen which was really strange because they were wearing jeans and t-shirts like the rest of the people around me. They told me that they were doing a check of the citizens and needed to see my passport to prove that I was in this country legally. How did they know that I wasn't from there? Anyway, I didn't want to give them my passport although I had it so I gave them a copy of my passport. But they took the copy and walked off to talk in hushed tones again while I started to get worried. They came back and, in a really stern tone, asked me super personal questions. They also asked me if I was here alone and I lied and I told them that my boyfriend was waiting for me at the bus station. They asked me how long I was going to stay in the country for and at what time I was supposed to meet my boyfriend. And after I had answered all of them, they told me the copy of the passport just wasn't going to be enough. They said that I had to go with them into their car to the police station. Now, this country was a Spanish-speaking country, and although I know Spanish, I, I still find it hard to navigate at times. I started to tell them that I didn't understand over and over again, and they got louder, and I stood up and started to walk towards the center of the park, and at this point, they were following me and yelling at me. They were telling me that I was about to be arrested, and they were telling me that I was going to be sent to jail, and... I'm almost to the center at this point and I keep repeating no but louder and louder and I can see an uninformed policeman in the distance and I begin to cry and I mean a big ugly public cry and the men they are silenced at this point and they hand me my copy of my passport back and then they bolt and disappear into the park.
This happened in a city in the North Peninsula of Malaysia. So, my family was visiting my wife's cousin who had just given birth. She was in a room with six beds. Five of the beds were occupied and each bed had a curtain that would be pulled around the bed. It was visiting hour and so the curtains were mostly pulled back and there were visitors at all of the beds. The cousin was in the middle bed and the last bed was occupied but the bed opposite that one was empty. So there were people visiting at the last bed and one of them was a young girl of perhaps but not more than seven. As people were chatting the girl suddenly cried out in anger leave my auntie alone. Everybody looked at her and her mother went beside her and asked who are you talking to and she said him whilst pointing to a spot just above the empty bed. The mother asked what's he doing and she said he's making faces at auntie. Her mother then said to her that's okay he won't do anything come let's go get a drink and then she led the girl out of the room and I think that she was trying to calm the girl down or something. After this, I, I did some asking around and I was told that that wing of the hospital is reputed to be haunted and it was the oldest building in the hospital complex. It was a really odd experience to say the least and the girl was completely normal from what I could tell. It was strange and to this day I, I still don't know what to think about it. Hey everyone, so first I, I guess I should say that I'm actually Russian so my English can be a, a little bit off sometimes but I hope you'll understand the story that I'm about to tell you. So this happened a long time ago when I was a kid. If you didn't know, Russia is filled with apartment houses and we don't really have much space or privacy because there might be a bunch of neighbors living at the same floor with you so everyone pretty much knows everyone. We had two entrance doors, one was made of metal and the other behind the first one was made of wood. It was a pretty common thing for Russia in early to mid noughties despite the fact that they weren't really safe. So basically my family and I lived in a cement box behind two very thin doors. This happened at night as I got up to go to the toilet which was near the entrance but at first I had to go through the living room where my parents were sleeping. And so you'll understand that that's why I wasn't allowed to turn on the lights in order to not wake up my mum and dad. And my path to get there was obviously passing through complete darkness which I was afraid of in my childhood. Anyway, when I got to the toilet door I, I saw a silhouette of a man just standing at the end of the corridor near our entrance and exit. I just stood there completely frozen looking at him and I was sure that this was a person, whoever it was and they were looking at me. He was pretty tall but normal, about 190 centimeters or so and he was wearing all black and I couldn't see anything but his eyes just staring at me. He kept silent and he wasn't moving or anything. I knew that this couldn't have been any of our neighbors for sure because I've never seen a person corresponding to his height. I took one step back still looking at him and then I just ran to the living room to wake up my dad. He didn't really believe me at first about the man standing in our hallway and doing literally nothing but I insisted that he should go and make this person leave or call the police. My dad eventually got up and saw this man and said something like, what the hell are you doing in here, went to him and then literally pushed him out of the apartment, although this man didn't really resist which was really strange. And afterwards, dad checked if the doors were locked and told me to go back to sleep. I still don't know what that was because this person just did not look like a regular burglar, at least because he wasn't doing anything. I mean, he just broke into someone's apartment and was just staring at their kid. I mean, sure, maybe if I didn't get up he would have robbed our apartment and left, who knows, but it was strange to say the least. Such situations are not really common in my country, especially when someone breaks into a flat full with people in the middle of the night. Something was just really off about this whole story, but I was completely awake and so was my dad for the rest of the night, and we don't really know what that person's intentions were. Either way, I'm just really glad that nothing bad happened.
My bus route was really long, anywhere between one and two hours in fact, and I was one of the last stops too. It was on a really rural route with lots of mountains, dirt roads and hollowways. Being a rural area, most of these hollows were long windy roads that families and relatives lived on and normally just one or two families of kids to be dropped off at the same points. This meant that if a particular family of kids didn't ride the bus that day for whatever reason, that the bus driver could skip that hollow and save us anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes off the total route. And how could this ever be a bad thing, right? Well, one particular hollow, about 5 miles long, had only two stops, two different families, but the second family lived at the furthest point. It was easily three to four miles past the first family's drop-off point, down a crooked dead-end single-lane dirt road. It was always the worst part of the route each time. Now, on the days the second family did not ride the bus, if the bus driver skipped driving all the way to the second family's house, then it would save us uh, about 20 minutes on the round trip. Not to mention the stress of driving in the claustrophobic dirt road in a, a huge hulking school bus. There were also times the family waited to pick up the kids in their own car at the first drop off to save the bus time and spare it the experience of driving up that road. So, of course, when they could, the driver would turn around at the first family's drop-off point. However, this was not as smooth a turn as going the full way to the second family's house. This drop-off point was a, a small circular area with a couple of different driveways sprawling off, only one of which was large enough for a school bus to fit, and definitely not big enough for a bus to do a 360 turn in one swoop. But... With the help of one of the larger driveways, a three-point turn could get us out of there pretty easy. At most, the, the bus needed two meters of this driveway space and hardly 30 seconds of its time. We do this happily for as long as I can remember really until either new residents moved in or the existing residents of the trailer in this driveway, about 20 meters away, just lost their minds one day. Suddenly, there's a large red farm gate at the extreme end of the driveway but no possible way for the bus to turn around when closed, and for the first few months, whenever we would cut this route short by turning there, the driver would stop the bus during the three-point turn, open the gate, barely reverse into the driveway, pull out, stop the bus again, close the gate back exactly as it was, and get back on the bus and carry on saving us all around 20 minutes of needless driving. But keep in mind, this only happened when the second family either did not ride the bus or was being picked up at this point, aka not very often. Then, one day, we turn up and there's no lock on the gate, which we're all a bit weirded out by, I must admit. So we drive the 20 minutes and we carry on. Still, each time we have the chance to turn, the driver would check if it were unlocked and I don't know if it was ever requested to leave it unlocked, but I know from the driver's reactions that, that they wanted it to be that way. So if it did happen to be unlocked, we would take the shortcut and the driver would put the gate back as it was. To my knowledge, no one ever complained about this too. But then comes the day of the trap. We get to the first drop off. The second family was not riding the bus. Nothing looks amiss except, hey, what do you know? The gate's open. I can remember the smile on the driver's face as she put the bus into reverse and begins the turn. At this point in the ride, it's just myself and three to four other kids, only one being a grade above me, and I was barely six years old. Of course, I was chattering away with my friend and didn't notice at first that we'd stopped. Once I did start to look around, however, to my confusion, there was a, an assortment of ATVs, four-wheelers side-by-sides, and actual cars that had pulled out of the driveway to surround the bus. And it was every single direction, too. To make it even more confusing and, thinking back, horrific, but they all had an assortment of firearms. Now, I'm six and I grew up around guns. I wasn't scared by what I saw, but I also didn't realize I was being held hostage at gunpoint. All I remember is the feeling of profound confusion of not being able to work out, A, why we're sitting here, B, what are these people doing, and C, why are the other kids crying? Maybe I was blissfully ignorant, but the driver told us to just play on the floor and not look out the windows. So, 
Me being me, I propped my jacket up over the window in my seat and told everyone that we could play under my row, and I ended up having a great, albeit slightly boring, time just waiting. It went on for what felt like hours, and I never looked out the window during it, but I'm sure it was only uh, maybe an hour at most, give or take, because our parents slowly started showing up looking for us. I remember two kids being allowed off before me, and then, as I was growing truly bored, my grandfather showed up to save me too. He came onto the bus, spoke to the driver, and held my hand as we walked back to his truck, and no one else was saying a word except my cheery goodbye to the driver. I remember all of the gang just staring her down as I walked away, and she never moved from her seat the entire ordeal. I don't know what happened after I left, and it was only later that I grew up to realize the severity of the event. I know for sure that my grandfather and parents called the school system, but I never heard of any punishment or follow-up. The gate was never left open again, and we still had to drive that route each day, always driving it all the way through, except for those blissful days both families of kids just didn't ride and we could skip it altogether. The same bus driver stayed on the route, and she was honestly an angel to remain so calm and collected throughout that whole ordeal. This happened roughly three years ago when I was working for a small non-profit for mental health in Little Rock. I no longer work there, so I feel more comfortable sharing this, and honestly, typing out my last experience was cathartic for me, so here goes. Our organization is statewide, but our HQ was quite small. At the time, there were only three of us working at the office, and when this all went down, only my boss and I were in. We were already quite stressed out because we had learned just days earlier that my recently fired board member had been stalking my boss. She doesn't get scared easily and our job has us interacting with people who have done some seriously disturbing things but this sufficiently creeped her out. So I was hyper protective, definitely to a fault. Luckily I had my work cut out for me as the whole building and complex had cameras at every angle that our landlord checked regularly. So it was around 2 in the afternoon and the day had slowed down considerably. I took the opportunity to clean my office since I could never keep it organized for long and once I'd filled up two massive trash bags worth of junk and old papers I decided to step outside and make the short walk to take the trash out. Now when I say our organization is tiny I'm talking we take out our own trash and clean our entire building up tiny. I knew what my boss's stalker looked like and was fully prepared to deal with him, should he be on the premises or anything like that, and our front door was kept locked and I locked it back up as soon as I stepped outside, and my head was on a swivel the whole time. If I could have turned my head like an owl, I undoubtedly would have. I knew that I could mop the floor with this guy should he try anything, but I wasn't exactly going out searching for him or anything, but just kind of looking out for my boss was my goal. On the way back to the office, I was happy to see only employees from the other offices outside. I turned the left corner towards my office door, unlocked it and stepped inside. But before I could close the door, someone was directly behind me and said with impatience, I'm here to get Michael, where's Michael? He said it so fast that I didn't immediately register what he'd just said. I'd actually jumped out of shock too, I mean, how the hell did this guy get behind me so quickly? All the cars in the parking lot were cars that I recognized too, and my spidey senses, they were definitely flaring up. I'm six feet tall, and this man was right up there with my height. He looked super thin too, which is saying a lot coming from me, but he looked intensely frustrated. It was the beginning of fall, and he had a big jacket on and a do-rag, clothing one rarely wears when it's still 80 degrees outside. He gave no regards to personal space so I had to back away from him a bit causing him to come even further inside. Noticing this I, I stood my ground at this point. I told him that nobody named Michael works here and that well, we're not a service provider and that was clearly the last thing he wanted to hear because that only pissed him off. He began raising his voice and shouting I know one of y'all has Michael where the hell is Michael? And all I could say to him was that I have no idea who Michael is. I asked him if he was lost, how old he was and what he looked like and none of those questions got answered. 
He then said to me in just an absolutely enraged way that I was just over there pointing to another facility just a stone's throw to the east and they told me the same stuff. I know he's here, you're all telling me bullcrap. My efforts to calm him down were ineffective at best and I started getting frustrated myself but that feeling quickly turned to concern when I saw the grip of a handgun sticking out of his jacket pocket. Everything then clicked. I finally understood what I was 90% sure that I was dealing with at that moment. It also hit me that I was trapped. He was standing in the way of our exit and my boss could have exited through the back door but she was in her office and didn't know what was going on. I wasn't about to make a mad dash to the exit and leave her so my only option was to fight back if it came down to that. I took a few steps towards the guy, ready to crash into his hand if he makes any motion to draw. I disarmed plenty of rubber and unloaded guns, but the fear of permanent damage and or death puts a lot into perspective, that's for sure. Finally though, my boss stepped out of her office to see what was going on. I honestly don't remember what the man was shouting after I saw the gun, but he had not calmed down. I was just too laser focused on his right arm at this point. My boss was met with the same responses and roadblocks that I'd gotten regarding this Michael fellow, and despite all the stuff that had been going on with her former board member stalking her and whether or not she'd seen the gun too, uh, my boss made the ballsiest decision that I think I've ever seen. To say I'm thankful that we were in sync to make this work is putting it mildly too. Displaying complete control and confidence, my boss told the man, I think you may be looking for so-and-so facility just down here to the left. I'm so sorry that you were given bad directions, but it's in this complex. Let me walk you over there right now. And she walked him out the door and to the said facility. And as soon as they were out the door, I knew what to do. I called the facility and warned them that my boss, whom they knew well, was walking a man over to their facility and that he was armed and looking for someone named Michael. Given that this facility serves a lot of patients under Act 911, there's almost always at least one police officer over there too. When I saw the gun in his jacket, I came to the conclusion that this was an attempted hit on Michael, whoever that was. Gang activity has plagued Little Rock since the 90s and at one point it had the most murders per capita in all of the US. During the early 2000s it calmed down considerably but within the past 5 or so years gang violence has resurged in the city. Furthermore I've had prior experiences in Kansas with gang violence when a hitman came to our middle school to kill the son of a rival gang member in broad daylight mind you. But luckily he never made it inside though. That means that in both instances though, this was meant to be a message to the other gang. He wasn't hiding his face, he had no backup and his face was on all the cameras. My guess is that he'd already made plans to go to prison and thrive there but I don't know enough about gang life to say for certain what his follow up was going to be. But what had me terrified at that moment was that my boss was right in the middle of the danger now. I panicked after calling the facility and stayed in the office and I'm kind of ashamed that I did that to be honest. My boss returned after a certain amount of time but I actually don't remember the duration. She didn't tell me anything new, only that she'd let him there and thanked me for calling them. She hadn't seen the gun in his jacket but she too knew that something was just not right about him when she got a good look at him in her office. She said that she went to mother hen mode by leading the danger away from her coop and he clearly had been given bad directions which was mildly amusing. To be fair though, doing a google map search of that road shows a, a misleading display of everything on that small street. To the left of our office there are roughly 40 yards of trees that separate our complex from the facility that he pointed to. So I, I guess he was just coming out of the tree line as I was unlocking the door because I didn't see him coming. My boss didn't tell me about any new information the next day and I checked the police beat for a few weeks to see if anything was written about it. Thankfully I, I didn't see anything in the police beat about it which means that there was no one harmed. Well that we know of anyway. However we worked with and trained LEOs in crisis intervention and they would sometimes give us some inside info like where so and so was or wasn't safe, where gang activity was increasing, all that sort of stuff. 
One lieutenant that I worked with a lot eventually confirmed too that the man was, in fact, trying to kill Michael over gang disputes. I don't know what his relation was to the would-be hitman beyond that, especially why my mental health patient was a target, but hey, we may have saved someone's life that day, so that's good. I have my own theories about the whole thing, if anyone's curious to know, but I'm also curious to know what you all think. If any of you guys have any theories about this whole mess, if you guys have any questions, I'll try to answer them the best of my knowledge. Anyway, I guess the lesson here is to just stay the hell away from gangs. So, my parents, they were very lenient about me going outside to play all the time. And so, when I was younger, I would always ride my bike around the neighborhoods with just absolutely no purpose. Now, I live in a huge neighborhood, and when I say huge, I mean really, really big. And one day, I decided to go out for a ride, and when I was on my way home, a, a red SUV pulled up in front of me, blocking me. She was rolling down her window and asked if my parents knew I was out, and this is how the conversation went. I said, yes, my parents always know. She said, let me take you home. Where do you live? I said, no, I can just ride home myself. And then she said, please, I insist. Where do you live? And some of that kept happening too. And it went on for some time. But then she got really fed up with me and said, you're going to get into this car right now or I'll make you. And this is when I straight up booked it. This lady was crazy and I think I went so fast that I went forward in time. I was being chased though and I was looking between every house to see how I could escape through a gap in the fencing when I found one and I hid between the two fences and squished between them. I was so scared that I was crying and I walked to the neighbor's house to ask them to take me home. And I'm always pretty scared now and sometimes I, I see that red SUV nearby and if it sees me, it chases until I just duke them out. This has been an ongoing problem for a while now, and if you guys have any advice, I'll take it. So, I want to share some stories with you guys. I have about five or six that stick out to me the most, and those are the ones that I want to share. So... Some years back, I was watching TV with my mum in her room and my cousin. My mum asked me to get her a cup of water, and so I did, got the cup and began walking back to her room, and as I was about to exit the living to go into the hallway, someone just grabbed the bottom right of my shirt and whispered, it's going to be alright. But when I felt it and I heard it, I, I turned around obviously, and there was no one there. At the time, I, I took what the person said to heart and walked back into my mum's room where I found my cousin hiding under the blanket and my mum telling me to hurry into the room. I told her what had happened and she said that as I went through the living room toward the kitchen that she could see what looked like someone following behind me. Now, where I live there is a park across the street from my house and we were celebrating my younger brother's birthday at the park at some stage and I really needed to go to the restroom and didn't like how gross the ones in the park were so I asked my mum for the keys to the house so that I could use ours. I go to the house and lock the door behind me and I sat on the toilet ready to do my business when I heard what sounded like hooves clopping in the living room like a horse or something prancing around or something. I sat there confused until it stopped in front of the restroom and I said, who is it? And then I heard two voices at the exact moment, one of a girl and the other really deep, but they sounded like they came from the same person almost. But the voices shouted, get out at me, and so I put my pants back up and opened the door and looked toward the front entrance door and I saw it fling open the door and then slam shut. At this point, I began crying and just sat outside for a few minutes because I just had no idea what happened. I wanted to know so bad who or what it was that I remember saying as a kid that if you show me who you are, I'll let you play on my Super Nintendo. Now, I also suffer through sleep paralysis a lot, but mainly when I sleep on my back. My sleep paralysis consists of me just basically still having my eyes closed and unable to move. 
I don't see figures or anything like that. What happens to me though is that I feel myself get dragged from the back of my neck to the top corner of my room above my bed. I can feel the bumps and the coldness of the wall behind me and sometimes if it's not just being held up there I, I get dragged along the ceiling as well. So this one day I was asleep in daytime and I had my eyes open during my sleep paralysis episode except this time I was dragged on the floor and made to face the direction of the front door. For a better understanding of this, my room is a a makeshift room created in what used to be the dining room. So it's my room and then the kitchen and then the living room. And as I laid there on the floor I could remember feeling the small rocks and the dirt on my face. After a bit, I heard my mum's car come home and I knew it was her because of a certain whining noise it does when pulling in. So I saw her come into the house and tried to shout out to her, but she was on her phone and didn't see me to the right on the floor. Obviously, I'm in a sleep paralysis episode. She walked past me into her room and I saw everything that she wore and a few seconds later I got dragged back into my bed and I got up and ran straight to my mum. But the thing is, is that she was in the house still on the phone, and she was wearing exactly what I saw her wearing when I was on the floor. I don't know if that's just a coincidence, but it was really creepy. Another night when I was asleep, I had a dream that I was in a room and someone walked in just looking in my direction and smiling while they walked to my TV to turn it on. After they did, they just walked out and locked my door. In my head, I I knew that he was putting on a screamer video, so I ended up going under my blanket and just covering my ears. I was right about that too, because the screams, they just wouldn't stop. I woke up from my dream, and I could hear the screaming still in my room, so I bolted out to find my brothers asleep on the floor in the living room, and I looked across the hallway to see my mum awake staring at me. She told me to just sleep with my brothers, and when I woke up, I obviously told my mum what had happened, and... She said that she heard the woman screaming in my room too, since my room shares a wall with hers. I thought at the time that I was like residual dreaming or something and the scream was still in my head while I was fully waking up. But my mum said that she heard the scream too. She said at the time that she told me to sleep in the living room because, well, if a demon wanted me it could take her instead. Also, uh, I moved to North Cell three years ago, away from all my family members. There was one cousin I used to be very close to when we were kids as well. I was four years older than her, but we hung out together all the time during the gatherings until I stopped going around the age of 16. So fast forward 11 years of us not talking anymore or even seeing each other since I don't go to family gatherings anymore and I had a dream some cousins and I were driving in a car near my grandma's house in Mex. We stop the block before reaching her house and she gets out. I'm sitting there wondering why she got out of the car so soon and I ask my cousin who's driving and he says that she's not coming with us anymore. We begin to drive away and I stick my head out of the window and I see her crying and waving goodbye. I wave by back to her confused and sad look and when I wake up in the morning I I get a call from my dad while I'm getting ready to go to work. He tells me that she just died in the morning during complications trying to give birth. But keep in mind, I I speak to no one outside of my immediate family and I didn't even know that she was pregnant, much less about to give birth. And to be honest, I, I never really thought about her or dreamt of her ever before. And this reminds me of one that I was going to brush aside, but it's a bit similar, so I'll just add it. So... I was hanging out at a friend's house with three other people. Around six, I got this terrible feeling that something happened to my dad or someone's dad and I told them to just do me a favor and call their dads to make sure everything was okay and I did the same. Nothing was wrong, so I felt a little better and a little embarrassed, but I just couldn't really enjoy the night because I just felt wrong inside. When I got home and go on Discord to talk to a friend of mine, he ended up telling me that his dad got into a really bad car accident and died. And those are the five most memorable moments of spooky things that have happened to me. When I was a kid, my brother and I shared a bedroom. And let me set the scene for you too. 
So there were two beds, one on each side of the wall, a window between us at the far side of the room and a closet which stays shut at night to the left as you walk into the bedroom door. There's a dresser on each side of the walls as well and at the foot in between our beds we had an oscillating fan for the summer heat. Now one night we were sleeping and I awoke tossing and turning and I just kept hearing a, a mechanical clicking sound. So I I slowly and groggily turned my head towards the noise and saw our fan surrounded by a, a really large shadow, larger than our parents, and it was holding down the oscillating portion of the fan. I stared for what felt like forever and slowly turned to my brother who, to my surprise, was staring directly at me and gave me the smallest head shake of no. He's the older brother so I listened and I put my head back down and angled my view to keep an eye on the fan. The clicking continued throughout this time and after a few minutes the clicking stopped but the shadow stayed and it then moved very slowly in front of the fan and just remained at the foot of our beds the whole night. The crazier thing is too is that we could still feel the fan as it was standing in front of us. Our eyes darted back and forth between the shadow and each other for confirmation and we just stayed awake the rest of the night not wanting to close our eyes. At some point the sun came up and the shadow just disappeared and we found ourselves with a story that we couldn't explain to anyone and an opened closet door. It's been 20 plus years and we still talk about that night. When I was in grad school, I moved to a new state and picked a cheap apartment on the bus route to class without ever visiting the place first. The landlord was nice enough and I felt comfortable going through the lease process via email with him. Once I got there it seemed normal enough, if a bit dated, and it was in a quiet neighborhood which was nice since I would moved from rural midwest to a quarter of a million population city. Now, I don't know if the following experiences are isolated or related or have other explanations, but here's what happened. So from the get-go, I, I felt the need to sleep with a light on. I've never been one to need a light at night except maybe after a particularly scary movie, but for the entire year I lived there, that's exactly what I did. I felt particularly creeped out by the closet near the front door, and ideally, you'd store coats and a vacuum in there, but... I just didn't use it and I can't really explain why. But the way it was situated relative to the rest of the room, it, it made the front door just really dark. And when I sat in the living room, I, I often felt like I was being watched from that area or something. I tried to avoid looking over there, but it always drew my eyes. And this was, in fact, the only way to leave my second floor apartment. So I always rushed out quickly without looking and zoomed past the closet on my way in again without looking. Now, I've dealt with many burnt out bulbs in my day, but I've never lived somewhere where the bulbs actually shatter until I live there. It happened to a few in my bedroom. The second time it happened, I had the landlord check the wiring and he had that replaced just to be on the safe side, but it persisted, so I just used lamps in there instead. But one night, I, I woke up and I immediately shut my eyes tight again because... It honestly felt like something was weighing down the bed beside me. Like it was actually sagging but there wasn't anything physical there and I had this thought that if I just didn't look that it might leave. I kept my eyes shut for several moments and then felt the weight just leave the bed. Another night I experienced what is probably best described as sleep paralysis. Well, kind of anyway. So I woke up completely terrified with my blanket over my head. This happened a lot here. I think even subconsciously I was hiding from this thing in my apartment. And I actually could move, which is why I don't think sleep paralysis is quite what it was. But I was too scared to move, so I just sat there. I slowed down my breathing and then I, I heard a second something breathing, slightly out of sync with my own. I held my breath to see if my tired brain was just playing tricks, but the breathing continued. I don't know how long I laid there with my blanket over my head just listening to this other breathing, but it did eventually stop. 
There's other instances too like this, but those are the ones that stand out in my mind the most. I moved out after my lease was up and when I was moving out, a neighbor that I occasionally made small talk with commented on my moving and I said something along the lines of, yeah, the place is creepy anyway, to which he responded that he agreed and then admitted that he always took the long way to the laundry room to avoid my part of the hallway. It was just a really strange time for me and since then I, I haven't had anything else happen. In a life just full of weird encounters, I, I feel like this is the creepiest one that I've ever experienced. So, I was a single woman living alone at the time. My apartment building was isolated near the edge of town, where most of its neighboring property was a, a large empty field. I was about to go on a long trip and I'd been up all night cleaning and packing and whatnot. A little before 6am I decided to get some laundry done and it's critical to the story that you understand the structure of the building so I apologize if this part's a little dull. But basically all of the apartments opened up directly outside like a motel so there were no hallways or anything and my apartment opened up on a fenced in porch with stairs leading down to the street. The fence continued around the yard and there was a drop off of about um, 6 feet on the other side meaning that the only way to get to and from my apartment was to go down those narrow cement stairs. The stairs opened up to an alley which you had to take in order to get to our building's laundry room. A single washer and dryer were available in a locked tiny space right behind the apartment. Now, I didn't want to keep going up and down the steps, so I wrestled a huge bag of laundry and made my way to the alley. And even though it was technically the morning, it was still pretty pitch black outside. There was a safety light attached to the building, but beyond that, the path was lit only by the moon and the stars. It was so quiet outside too that I scared myself by accidentally kicking a rock. In other words, there wasn't another soul around. So it took me maybe uh, two minutes max to get the laundry into the washer, pour the soap and deposit the coins. I locked the door behind me and headed back towards the alley again when I turned the corner and I froze. At the end of the alleyway, right in front of the only opening to the stairs, there was a, a woman standing with her back to me. Her body was stiff and unnatural, like a, a wind-up toy. Her feet were about a foot apart and her arms were slightly lifted, straight out at her sides. Her head was up, but it was kind of jutting forward as if her neck were extra long or something. She didn't move or act like she heard my footsteps at all and... I immediately held my breath, going still myself. I waited for the woman to move, but she stayed like that, arms splayed, head crooked. She was completely blocking the way, and I'd have to slide past her to get to the stairs. Though she wasn't doing anything other than just standing in a creepy way, I, I had no idea why she was there or what she was capable of, so obviously I, I wanted to avoid confronting her. Unfortunately, though, I... I didn't have a lot of options. My cell phone was still inside because I hadn't expected the run to the laundry room to take more than a minute. I had my car keys, but my car was parked in front of the building, meaning that I'd have to walk past her to get to it. And so I, I just sat there for what felt like ages, heart pounding, mind racing. I was so freaked out that my eyes were watering and all the while the woman just didn't so much as twitch. I debated knocking on a neighbor's door, but since she wasn't attacking me, I, I thought it might be stupid to wake people up. I wasn't sure if I was overreacting or not, and I couldn't just stand around all night, right? So, after a good amount of time, I decided to force myself to walk past her. And yes, this is the part of the horror film where I should have died. So, I took slow, cautious steps towards her, and still, she was frozen. As I got closer, I, I kept expecting her to turn toward me, but with only a foot left between us, she still had it. I took a deep breath and began to slide by her until I could finally see her face. And I'll never forget the way that she looked. Her eyes were bulging wide, unblinking, staring straight ahead. Her jaw was completely slack, mouth open almost unnaturally wide. 
Seeing her head hunch forward from the side was even more horrific than from the back too and I immediately thought that should the zombie apocalypse be on the horizon, I was about to be one of the first victims. And then she started to move. Not her body, just her head. Her shoulders remained stiff and slumped forward, her arms still straight at her sides, but her head, that head on her oddly long neck, began to just loll toward me. Her eyes didn't move, but she twisted until our gazes met. Her expression just completely unchanged, less than a foot away from me now. And that was it. I ran the rest of the way up the steps and inside my apartment I locked the door and stood against it for a long while while just shaking from the encounter. And when I looked out of the peephole again, she was completely gone. But I waited until the sun was shining bright before I went back to get my laundry. I tell you that much. And after that, I stopped washing my clothes when it was dark out. This is a story about a, a guy who stalks me. So basically, this happened about three years ago, although this guy still tries to contact me sometimes, and his name is Dean. Now, my dad owns a golf course, and we're constantly hiring new people. I worked there every summer up until last year, and Dean got hired, and I was pretty excited because he was younger and pretty cute. But we would talk a lot when we were working and he also managed to get my number so he would text me every so often to see how I was doing or what I was up to. After a while of working with him, I considered him a close friend and enjoyed his company. I was in my final year of high school and was planning on going and taking a year off to travel around Europe by myself. And it was around this time that I started to notice that I would see Dean just everywhere. He would be at the mall or the grocery store and basically everywhere that I was. He started texting me really creepy things out of nowhere too, like he wanted to have kids and he wanted to be with me forever. I would hang out with him once in a while too and the last time that we tried to hang out, he tried to sexually assault me and that was the point where I realized that he was dangerous. Pretty soon after, I started to cuddle contact with him. About a month later, he shows up at my house and tells me that he bought a plane ticket to England and he's coming with me and he's excited he never has to leave me again. My dad had to call the police and he was arrested and taken away and a little bit after this I leave for the year and when I get back, he's still trying to contact me. He messages me every day so finally my dad and I agree to meet with him. I tell him that I'm getting a restraining order and he tells us that he doesn't think that he can live without me and he's going crazy. And that's the last time that I've talked to him in person. But every so often, I'll get a text message from a random number and it freaks me out knowing that he's still living in my area. Not sure what I'm going to do if I see him up close again, but I sure hope that that doesn't happen. So back when I was still in high school, my dad left my mum and I went to live with this friend about an hour and a half from us. I was 15 when this happened and I'm now 24 and neither of my parents will tell me why my dad left. But anyway, after my dad left my mum lost her job because he took the only car and we ended up living in a motel a couple of towns over from town that we used to live in. Even though we lived in a different town, I, I still went to a school in my old town and they would pick me up in the bus or van and bring me to and from school. A few months after living in the motel, I made this friend in school named Randy. He was really cute and we got along really well. Near the middle of the school year, my dad actually had a warrant out for his arrest because he hadn't paid child support for my other siblings in a long time because he just couldn't afford it or something like that. So obviously, he ended up getting arrested and he spent 90 days in jail about a mile down the road from the motel my mum and I were in and when he got out, he came and stayed with us again. Near the end of the school year, I was at one of my friend's houses when I got a call from my dad telling me that we got an apartment in the town that I go to school in. I was actually really excited and happy about this and a few months go by and things are going smoothly. 
and this is when Randy and I decided that we wanted to hang outside of school for the first time. I didn't really hang out with anyone outside of school pretty much ever because if I missed the bus that would take me from school to the motel then I'd be stuck with no way home and nowhere to stay. But Randy was pretty much my only friend at the time too so I thought yeah let's hang out I suppose. We decided that we would go drop our stuff off at my house and then go and do whatever until one of us eventually had to go home. So we start walking home from school and we get onto my street when Randy says, Hey, I used to live in this street a few months ago. And I asked him which house he lived in and he gave me my house and apartment number. At the time, I thought it was pretty cool that he used to live in the house that I lived in now. Skipping ahead a few weeks though, Randy and I would hang out pretty often and grew pretty close. But then he told me that he wanted more and wanted to go out with me. My boyfriend and I broke up a few weeks after I moved back to town and I was actually then pregnant with his baby. I was now 16 and pregnant so I told him that and that I wasn't looking for a relationship because of my situation. He said that he understood and that we could just be friends. But now, every time we hung out, he would try and pull a move on me but it wasn't anything huge like kissing me or trying to have sex with me or anything. He would just tell me how beautiful I was and how my ex was an idiot for not being with me or try and hold my hand or put his arm around me or something. I told him every time to knock it off and that I wasn't comfortable with what he was doing and he would stop and wouldn't do anything again for a few days. So things were going pretty good and Randy was keeping his hands and flirts to himself until one day we were hanging out at my house on a rainy day. We were sitting on my bed watching YouTube videos when I started having stomach pains, so I decided to lay down. We continued with me laying on my back and him sitting next to me for about 20 minutes, but then the pain got worse, so I rolled over and pulled my knees up and then I felt him put his arm around me and put his body against mine, basically spooning me. I sat up real fast and asked him what the heck he thought that he was doing and he just kind of stared at me for a minute and then he tried to kiss me. I completely freaked out and pushed him off my bed because I have PTSD and it makes me freak the hell out when people touch me and he knew this really well too. So I started flipping out on him a little bit and made him leave. After he left, I locked all the doors and told him that I didn't want to see him anymore and then blocked him on everything. But things were going good for a while too. My ex blocked me when I told him that I was pregnant because he thought that I was lying to try and trap him even though I broke up with him and had several positive pregnancy tests and then once I got my first ultrasound I had a mutual friend of ours send a picture of it to him and it had my name on it and everything and how the baby was. He unblocked me at that point and told me that he believed that I was pregnant now and was helping out with what he could, coming to appointments with me and looking for a job and all that. He wanted to get back together, but I refused, saying that I just wanted him as the father of my baby. He would be nothing more than that, and the point in all of this is that we became good friends again, and I ended up telling him what Randy did, and he did not take it well. He immediately messaged him, and they actually set up a fight for the next day in the school auditorium. Stupid, right? They both got suspended, obviously, and I found out my ex is a horrible fighter, too. A few days after the fight, I actually had a miscarriage as well. I was out of school for a couple of weeks now and work got around pretty quickly because now my ex was once again telling everyone that I wasn't actually pregnant and I was lying to try and trap him, even though we had come to appointments where I had ultrasounds and I had a little baby bump as I was three and a half months along and I'm a very petite girl. So everyone in the school started to hate me and all the people started bullying me and messaging me telling me just how awful I am and all that sort of stuff. So things were not going well for me. But Randy beat the heck out of my ex for this. Like, I'm talking put him in the hospital kind of thing and honestly, I was pretty scared. I didn't know why he did that or pretty much anything to be honest. Anyway... But one night, I, I woke up to the sound of someone in my room, so I turned my light on and there's Randy, sitting in the chair in my room. I was home alone at the time, so I was pretty terrified by this and I asked him what the heck he was doing in my house and how he got in and he told me that he came through the back door because apparently 
It's easy to pick the lock to the bottom door and the top door doesn't have a lock and my parents didn't think it was necessary to put one on there. Now, to clarify, I'm on the second floor and we have a back porch with a door that leads to some stairs that leads to another door into the house. I started freaking out obviously and told him to leave and all that and started screaming at him because of all the stuff that was happening and how it was all coming out at this moment. I started crying and he like rushed over to me and tried to hold me and at this point I shoved him away. But then he got really really angry and pulled out a knife and at this point things changed. He started screaming at me about how he just wanted to love me and be there for me and I just kept hurting him and he didn't deserve that. You know, that truly delusional, obsessed person talk. So I start trying to talk to him and get him to calm down. He's listening and I start slowly turning us around and so I'm near the door and he's not and he realizes this and grabs me and tells me that I'm not going anywhere. Now he's really angry too. And he's telling me about how now he really sees that I don't see how good he is for me and that that just won't do and that if he can't have me, no one can. He starts freaking out saying, what am I going to do? And in his mini freak out, he turns away from me and I grab something and just start beating him with it. But he's not going down. He's just taking the hits like nothing is happening and just lunges at me with the knife. I dodged him, but he still got me. I now have a nice slice on my side too and that caught me off guard so while I was distracted he got up and just kicked me in the back so hard that I flew a few feet. But that hurt so bad and knocked the wind out of me so I was just laying there thinking that I'm actually going to die here and now he's walking all slow towards me saying how I shouldn't have done that and now I'm going to pay and all this sort of stuff when a cop kicks down the door and tackles him and another one comes and scoops me up and carries me off into the street while six other more huge cops run into my room. I was taken to the hospital and treated and I found out later that he was apparently on MDMA and it took seven guys and being tased four times to actually take him down and apparently... It was all thanks to my neighbor for hearing my distress and calling the cops that I'm alive today. At the time, he was only 15, so he didn't actually go to jail, but he got five years probation and six months community service. But his family moved away after that, and I haven't seen him since, thankfully. I've recovered nicely as the most damage that was done was a huge nasty black and blue bruise covering most of my back for a couple of months and a, a pretty deep cut. Thankfully, it wasn't too deep and didn't hit anything and he didn't kick hard enough to do any sort of severe damage so I got lucky and I'm actually fine now. I live in a major metropolitan area of DC and try to practice keen situational awareness and stay aware of any present danger. Well, that's probably putting it lightly though. To be honest, I, I've seen some stuff and I'm pretty paranoid these days. I'm also a petite woman who has looked 16 for the past decade and therefore am a target for creeps. Depending on what part of the city I'm going to or how late I plan to be out, I sometimes straps a fixed blade hunting knife to myself. I conceal it under my pants or boot in the winter and in the summer I either strap it to my arm or around my waist. Neither of which are really comfortable but you know safety and all that. So it was raining that night and I was wearing an oversized retro windbreaker that I had just found at the thrift store and the knife was in my purse. The humid DC summer made my skin sticky and the thought of having a sheath around my arm was very unappealing. I got onto the metro towards home but the conductor announced that the train was going to go out of service on the stop before mine. One of my buddies lives two blocks away from that metro stop so I just texted him seeing if he wanted me to stop by and smoke him up. He responded saying that he would be on his balcony and I could stop by and yell for him to let me into the building whenever. Now, on the train, I, I usually listen to music, read, crochet, or stare out the window with regular intervals of casing the train for any sketchy stuff. 
But once in a blue moon, people get robbed on the metro, and if I see packs of teens or people moving up and down the aisle without sitting down, I, I just pack my stuff up and tuck my bag underneath myself. It was right before rush hour, and the train was fairly full at this point. I didn't sense anything unusual until I noticed a guy who looked sort of out of place sitting across the aisle facing me. DC has people from all over, and people rarely, if ever, stand out to me as looking suspicious or unusual. But something about this guy just triggered my spidey senses. This guy was skinny and had greasy dark hair, and it looked sort of... Uh, Eastern European or Euro-Asian or something. He was wearing a purple button-down and tight pants and kept talking on the phone while checking another phone in his lap. I speak Russian and know some Spanish and can get the gist of similar languages and could tell that he was speaking Italian and describing a small female with brown hair and a jacket. He also kept saying Sola, which really got my attention. Solo or Sola means alone in many languages. I got pretty anxious at that point and my heart started pounding harder every time he looked over at me. The best case scenario, he was just some slimy dude describing me to his friends, but life is too short to count on the best case scenario. So I put my bag on my lap and discreetly strapped the knife to my arm underneath the baggy sleeve of my jacket, just in case. I texted my friend to see if he could meet me at this metro station so that I wouldn't have to walk by myself. However, the reception in the train was really bad and I didn't notice that the text didn't go through. So, the train arrived at my stop and I tried to wait until the very last second to get off so that he couldn't follow me. The doors closed a second or two right behind me but he was a skinny dude and managed to slip through them. I started picking up the pace and tried to get lost in the crowd on the way to pay my fare. Once I paid, I started booking it to my friend's place without running so fast as to make myself more visible. I turned around and saw that no one was behind me, but wouldn't relax until I was at my friend's apartment. There was a big burly guy who lived near my friend's building who would blast 80s jams and work out on his porch every evening. I prayed that he would be out there by the time that I passed by his house so that I could chill there for a second and call my friend. I walked by his house, but... Unfortunately, he wasn't there, and I heard footsteps behind me and turned around. As I feared, it was a purple shirt guy gaining on me. I started running and, in my panic, didn't notice that the car was stopped in the middle of the road a few feet ahead of me with the side door wide open. The guy caught up to me and lunged with his hands around my waist, and he was surprisingly strong for such a thin guy. In one of what was probably the most crucial decisions of my life, I pulled the knife out and just stabbed wherever I could, flailing to get free. I heard fabric rip, the serrated knife had gotten caught on his shirt, and I used the leverage of him gripping me to actually aim this time and got the knife under his button down and just pushed it in as hard as I could. I had never been more aware of just how fundamentally defenseless I was in that moment. I couldn't even scream or make a sound at all and it was like I'd gone completely mute or had been holding my breath or something. I have no idea how deeply I cut him or how injured he was and honestly, I don't really care. He dropped me for a second and I took that moment and I ran across the street, almost getting hit by a passing car, up to my friend's apartment and I noticed an empty cop car sitting next to my friend's building and got incredibly paranoid. At the time, and probably still, my instinct was that the police would care more about me having a knife on me than almost getting kidnapped. My friend buzzed me into his building and I went inside the unlocked, going straight to his bathroom without saying hello. I washed my knife and the scrapes that I'd gotten in the struggle. I looked at myself in the mirror and, for some reason, decided not to tell my friend what had just happened. I sat with him on his balcony and just hung out and laughed as if nothing went down. I can't tell if it was shock or just being desensitized from the city, but to this day I only occasionally have moments where I realize the gravity of what happens, and I sure hope that telling it like this will help me wake up. About six years ago, over the summer of my junior year, going into my senior year of high school, I experienced something that I just can't quite shake off, even to this day. 
My friend's parents were going out of town for the weekend, so myself and three others, including my friend Matt, we planned a sleepover so that we could all hang out, be as loud as we want, and all that good stuff. We slept over at my friend Matt's house. His house was located on the east side of town where all that small wooded area was located. I mentioned this area in a previous story about the scream that I heard in my house, and, and that night we all mentioned how we would like to sleep on the trampoline since it was warm out and none of us had done it before. Matt was a little concerned with the idea because he had mentioned that homeless people and sometimes deer wander in and out of the little forest next to his house. But there was no fence separating us from the woods so pretty much anything could go in and out of the yard, into the forest and vice versa. I told him that we would be fine though and that there was nothing to worry about. But boy, do I wish that I could take that statement back. So we started setting up our spots on our tramp, getting cozy and just hanging out, looking at our phones and whatnot, and about an hour into this, I, I started to hear twigs snapping and leaves crunching. Matt was the only one who wasn't on the tramp at this point, but sitting on a small river donut on the deck next to the tramp, and he was sitting on it due to an injury that happened to him a few weeks prior to these events. I was looking at Matt while all of this was happening, and he was looking into the woods, he didn't really say anything other than a quiet, I told you this was a bad idea. I kept listening for a few minutes and then it stopped. My friends were all listening too, but they didn't seem concerned. It was really quiet too after it stopped. and None of us said anything and we all looked back on our phones and that's when I saw it. The second my eyes met my phone... I saw from my peripheral vision this huge seven to eight foot tall thing just run out of the woods into the backyard and darted to the side of the house. All we saw was the silhouette of whatever it was. It was almost as if it was ghostly and it was just extremely like slim and bipedal. But here's the kicker though. We saw it run but we didn't hear it run. It made zero sound when it was moving but it made the motion of someone running. But when we saw this, we all did the exact same thing. We all screamed and ran off the tramp. Matt was the first one inside, and to be honest, I was surprised that he was even able to walk, let alone run, because of his injury. We left some blankets and pillows outside because we were in such a hurry, but we didn't care. We just shut and locked the sliding door and all of the windows and the doors that we could find. We kept looking out some of the windows to see if we could see anything, but there was nothing. Because we were so startled too, we just stayed up until sunrise to finally go to sleep. I think about what happened on almost a daily basis to this day. Everyone I've told has a theory that it came from the mountains next to the forest or something. But for a little backstory, I, I live in Magna, Utah. The mountains on the east side that separate us are said to house some sort of a, a secret military base where experimentation and other things are done on who knows who or what. Anyway, I'm not sure if I believe in all that sort of stuff, but that night, I'll never forget it. As a child, we had nine acres of woods behind our house that we owned. My uncle used it as his old car storage, but there were old trails and my cousin and I would camp back there a lot. We had a little camping spot under a big tree that had red flowers that pointed down. We would usually rough it by putting our sleeping bags on a pile of dead leaves and put a tarp over us angled like a lean-to tent and just sleep there. But the property was sort of a, a skinny rectangle too, so the woods were very long and it would take about 10 minutes to walk from my house to the camp spot, I'd say. Anyway, this all happened during a solo camp. So I woke up in the middle of the night and noticed the tree was glowing a bright red and the lights were sort of waving in and out. I thought it was a dream so I just watched the flowers for a few minutes and I noticed a, a deer behind one of the trees just staring right at me. It kept its gaze on me for what felt like a really long time and I actually poked my hand as a reality check and realized that I wasn't dreaming. I got up and tried to get the deer to back off so I put my arms in the air and when I did the deer got closer to me and I noticed that it was actually on its hind legs. At this point I decided to just book it out of there and started running back home. 
I ran for my life and I didn't even turn around to see if anything was behind me, but I knew that the thing was chasing me because I could hear it. But while running, I felt as if the trees nearby were angry at me or something, and I could just sense danger and anger and hate all around me. But when I finally got home, I, I felt a lot safer and I couldn't sleep, so I stayed up and I just watched a movie. Hey guys, so uh, this post I'll be sharing two stories from totally separate instances in fact. The first one I'll share happened to a, a friend of mine and I and the second one happened to a family friend and it was similar in many ways to what happened to me and my friend. So the first story is that uh, it happened to me and a friend one night a few years ago and it still freaks both of us out. For some background, he lives in a neighborhood surrounded by a forest in which some of these steel power line towers are located. It's also important to note that there's a man who lives down the road from him who owns what I guess to be around 50 cattle. So anyway, I was spending the night at his house on a Friday night sometime in the fall and we were bored and couldn't drive ourselves anywhere yet so we decided to hop on his ATV and go drive around on this dirt road that led through a forest to some power lines right outside of his neighborhood. We drove to the end of the paved road in his neighborhood and started driving down the dirt road. For a few minutes, we drove normally down this road, guided by the headlights on his ATV, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary until we heard a cattle groaning up ahead, which it was confusing to us because the man who owns the cattle lived another mile or two down the road, and he lived on the other side of the road, and so his cattle, they never crossed onto this side that we were on. We drove farther up ahead to see where the cattle noises were coming from and that's when things just started getting weird. We drove around a bend in the road and our lights shone across the fence surrounding the main power line tower. Behind the fence stood a group of cattle packed tight into a square of fencing around the tower and we sat there for a moment just staring at them, totally confused as to how they got in there. There seemed to be no signs of the fence or barbed wire at the top being broken and the gate was padlocked shut. We sat there for a moment just staring at them, totally confused as to how they got in there in the first place. I mean, there seemed to be no signs of the fence or barbed wire at the top being broken and the gate was padlocked shut. We sat there for a few more minutes and talked about how this could have happened, before deciding to just move on and drive further down the road. We drove for a few minutes until the end of the road came into view and we slowed down and stopped for a second to discuss whether we wanted to go into the forest to look around for fun or for a bit or just turn around and drive back home. As we walked though, an intensely bright light appeared from the edge of the forest. This made us jump but we laughed it off because we assumed it was just a motion sensor or trail cam or something. But then it started moving towards us. At this I... I yelled at him to go and he hit the accelerator and we spun around and sped off down the trail. I looked behind us to see if it was still coming and sure enough it was and it was speeding up as well. But for a second I thought that we must have unknowingly trespassed on somebody else's property and they were now chasing us on an ATV or side by side or something but I realized that this light was about seven or eight feet off the ground and I heard no other motor going besides our own when normally you can distinguish the sounds of two vehicles when they're close to each other. I kept yelling at my friend to go faster, but he was already going as fast as he could. The light got even closer as it sped up until it was only about 10 yards behind us. I looked ahead and saw that we were approaching the tower where the cattle were still standing, and we flew by it as fast as we could, and I looked back at the light, and that's when another strange thing happened. As it was about to pass by the tower... It instantly came to a complete stop without slowing down. It did this without making a sound too. I looked back ahead at my friend and told him that it stopped and we both looked back again and it was just completely gone. To this day we still have no idea what happened that night or what we saw. The next morning we went to check to see if the cattle were still there and they were gone. And again there were no signs of any break in. Now, the second story happened to a, a family friend back in the 70s. The lady who this happened to is from the same rural town as my mum and she was driving home from babysitting my mum one night. 
Her family owned a farm a few miles outside of town, and they had a large herd of cattle. And as she did this, a huge bright light appeared in the air behind her car. It followed her closely, and she began to get pretty scared that a police helicopter was following her or something. And it was then that she realized that there were no sounds of a helicopter coming from this light. It was just completely silent. She drove faster and down the road, trying to lose it, but it just kept following her. Then finally, when she passed the feedlot where the cattle her family owned were located, the light just disappeared completely. She sped home, still scared, and told her parents, who basically thought that she was pranking them or something. That was until the next morning when her father went out to check the cattle. He found three of them dead, with their blood drained completely, but... No gaping wounds or good explanation. The news spread quickly and they found out that this was not the only instance of mysterious cases of cattle mutilation to happen in the area. And to this day, I still have no answers. So when I was around 15, I'm now 22, I had a best friend of the same age and his house happened to back onto a cane field. So, this story took place when I was around 15 or so and was frequently staying over my best friend's house. We had been sitting in his living room playing video games all day and we were getting a little bored at this point and remembered his mum telling us that we should go play outside every now and then. And so, that's exactly what we decided to do. Just at 2.30am instead of the usual time of a 15 year old going outside, right? Anyway... We were both hanging out over the back fence looking into the cane field, chatting about how the sugar cane would taste and so on, when I had a great idea to jump the fence and go walking through this thick and very dark field. My friend, obviously him being 15 and stupid, also agreed to this idea. So we leaped the fence and walked straight into the field. We were walking for no more than 15 minutes when I turn and find that my friend is just completely gone. I just shrugged it off to him playing a prank or something and I called out his name a few times but there wasn't any answer and at that moment I started getting a little bit creeped out, it being dark and oddly silent and all that. Then just as I was getting ready to head back to the fence I, I see this extremely tall man standing in one of the rows looking at me. Now when I say extremely tall I mean like over 7 foot easily. I myself at 15 was just a little over 6 foot and this man towered over me with ease. We were both just standing there. I didn't even know if he was looking at me and then out of nowhere the man just broke out into a sprint coming straight for me and every step that he took was like three of mine. I didn't know what to do and I just froze and I had never in my life been so scared. So I just turned my back and got on my knees and covered the back of my neck. Who knows why I did this or even why I was thinking that it would help me, but that's what I did. After what felt like forever, but was probably only a few seconds, I, I hear my friend's voice calling out saying, Oi bro, did you see that huge dude? I lift my head after hearing this and turn around and the man isn't there or anywhere. And after that, nothing else happened. Well, except for me and my friend pissballing as fast as we could back to the fence. So I'm a 32 year old female and this is something that happened to me only two nights ago. My husband Kevin and I were on the porch smoking a cigarette and it was about 9 o'clock at night. We live far out in the woods right off a stretch of highway that's between two interstate exits. We were looking up at the stars, enjoying the quiet atmosphere of the crickets, glad to have a temporary relief from all of the usual traffic noise. But I heard something and shushed my husband, even though he hadn't said anything. And was that screaming? Yeah, it was a woman screaming like nothing I'd ever heard before. And it sounded like she was getting murdered or something. In between blood chilling screams she was screaming out help me help me and I looked at my husband and we were both really freaked out. The more she screamed the closer she was getting to the house too. 
I could eventually see a figure running along the median of the highway, making their way closer to the part of the highway that was in front of our house. Our house is a good ways back from our driveway, but not far enough that you can't see anything. And if we could see her, then that meant that she could see us. We have no yard security lights, stupid I know, so we were in complete darkness at this point. But we could still see the highway perfectly fine due to the house across from us who still had their Christmas lights up though. I threw my cigarette in my yard and back up to stand in my doorway of the house, pulling out my phone to call 911. She's still in the median of the road screaming too. If anyone else is in the surrounding houses heard her, they pretended like they didn't know. Kevin runs past me inside to get his jacket and his shoes on. I tell him not to go out there, obviously, but he ignores me and gets dressed anyway. As soon as he's out of sight, I, I see a red car barrel up the road and pull over next to where the lady was at. With her in the median, there was still a stretch of highway between them, though. But there was a man driving. I, I couldn't see what he looked like, though. I only heard his voice. He was yelling that he was going to kill her and calling her every name under the sun. It looked like he was throwing stuff at her out the window. Maybe clothes, I think. As soon as she sees him pull over, she starts running straight towards our yard. By that time, I was already on the phone with the police officers, but as I said, I lived out in the woods, pretty far out of town, I'll add, so it would take them a bit to get here. I yell for my husband, and I tell my nine-year-old son to go in our room with the baby is and close the door. He can hear the whole thing and was actually pretty frightened. My husband runs out onto the porch and into the yard towards her. He asks if she's okay, and she says that as she had gotten a ride home from this guy and halfway down the road, he started acting really creepy. He refused to let her out where she told him to and kept driving with her in the car. She looked behind her seat, pretending to look at a car behind them, and saw a roll of duct tape. Fearing for her life, she jumped out of the moving car and just started running down the road screaming for help. Kevin starts to lead her towards the house and by now is also on the phone calling the police, having gathered more information that I wasn't able to give them when I had called. They told him to stay on the line with them until an officer showed up and he lets her in the house and her face just it looks terrible. She's bright red and bleeding in a couple of spots, road rash from where she jumped out, but she also said that he had hit her before she was able to escape. So she came in and we locked our door, knob, deadbolt and chain. We stood together near the window waiting for the police to show up, Kevin giving updates and answering questions on the phone. No, they haven't gotten here yet. Yes, his car is still parked across the highway. It's a red sedan in front of the house with lots of blue porch Christmas lights. All that sort of stuff. I was trying not to lose my crap when there was a huge bang on our door. The man was yelling, I know you're in there, I saw you running, the people in there can't protect you. I shouted through the door that he needed to leave our property and if he was smart to get in his car and drive off. I told him that we were on the phone to the police and the answer he gave was the worst one that I could have heard. He says, go ahead, call the police, I don't care, they won't even be here in time and then starts banging on the door over and over again. But the woman was freaking out and crying, saying, help me, please help me, over and over again. I ran into the kitchen to get a large knife just in case. We had a huge solid iron door, but our windows were easily breakable. If he wanted to get in badly enough, he certainly could have. My husband just came from our bedroom with his gun when my squad car pulled up into the yard. Two more following behind it and one across the street where his car was. He took off on foot running and they tended to the woman and got her home safely. Turns out too that she lives on the highway across from us, five houses to the left. It had been two hours later and they still hadn't found him as well. There are a lot of places to hide in these woods as well and I just hope that he hides somewhere far away from here. Because I do not want to see that guy again. So my name is Eric and I live in a rural area of central New Mexico. I'm 18 years old and I've lived there for nearly all my life. It's a pretty quiet, tight-knit place where everyone seems to know everyone and this story took place about two years ago when I was a sophomore in high school. 
So me and one of my school buddies, Seth, we were going through somewhat of a, a mild obsession with urban exploration videos on YouTube. I had recently passed my driver's test and Seth and I were talking about finding somewhere nearby where we could go urban exploring, or I guess in our case, rural exploring. One day when I was driving Seth home from school, he told me about an abandoned radio tower on top of a mountain about 25 miles east of town that he thought would be really cool to explore. He showed me some pictures of the place and it did look pretty cool. It was located about 5 miles up what looked like to be a a narrow dirt road that branched off the main highway in and out of town. It was cool because we had always driven past that road too, but I never really thought about where it led. We both agreed then that we had to go and check it out, and I told him that that Friday night would be the best time to go. I don't know why we thought it would be better to go at night, but for some stupid reason we, we just did. My parents were really chill about letting me drive late at night, and so were his. We usually went out on Friday nights to meet up with friends from school anyway, so our parents didn't hesitate to let us go. Obviously, we didn't tell them about exploring the cell tower though, as they would never have let us go to some abandoned place in the middle of nowhere late at night. It was a stupid decision, I know, but we didn't expect to be very long and certainly didn't expect any trouble. We left at about 8pm and by the time that we got to the tower, the sun had set and it was almost completely dark. The road to the top was surrounded by forest on both sides. Soon after turning onto the dirt road, there was a cattle gate that we had to get out and open. I didn't realize just how big the tower was until we actually saw it up close. The tower itself was probably about 100 feet tall with a white building about the size of an average house at its base. We parked my Chevy about 20 yards from the tower and walked towards the building with our flashlights out. As we expected, the building's doors were locked, but we were able to crawl through a loosely boarded up window. The first thing we noticed about the place was just the unsettling musty smell. This place seemed to have been unused for quite some time at this point, as there was almost nothing in there besides a few tables and chairs. The walls were completely bare except for a few spots of graffiti, and it was completely silent except for the creaking of the floorboards. Then, suddenly, we both heard what sounded like the hum of an engine coming up the road. Seth and I ran to the front of the building and peered out a hole in one of the boarded up windows and, to our horror, there was a set of headlights coming up the road. We looked at each other and asked who the hell could possibly be up here with us at 9 o'clock at night. We watched as uh, an old Ford pickup pulled up right next to my car and what looked like two middle-aged men get out. We couldn't see their faces, but they were both wearing dark clothing and were clearly wearing hooded sweatshirts. They immediately took our flashlights and began looking into the passenger window of my car. One of the men seemed to point to something in my car and the other man appeared to shake his head as if in agreement. After a couple more seconds, they shined their flashlights up at the house and I could barely make out one of them saying, I bet they're still in there. At this point... Seth is freaking out, and I have to admit that I was too. And then, the men began walking towards the building. So, we instinctively began looking for a hiding spot. Maybe this was the wrong move, but we didn't know what else to do. We found one of those small storage rooms underneath the stairs leading up to the second floor of the building. We closed the door and both crouched down in the darkness, all the while shaking in fear. Seth began to say something, but I quickly told him to be quiet. And there was nothing but silence for what seemed like a good two minutes, and I actually started to wonder if maybe the men had left. But my thinking was interrupted by the sound of one of the men kicking down the padlock door. But the noise was so loud that I swear I nearly had a heart attack too, and Seth and I were both terrified when we heard the sound of the mostly rotten wooden door breaking in half before the loud crash of it falling onto the wooden floorboards. Light filled the underside of the small door to the room that we were in as the men shined their flashlights around the building. It was strange though as they never said a word to each other or called out for us or anything. I was just waiting for the door to the storage room to swing open and for us to be gone as but to our surprise... The men just never opened it. After about five minutes of hearing the men rummaging around the bottom floor, 
and we both heard the creaking of the stairs above our heads as the men began to walk up them. And as soon as the men reached the second floor, I whispered to Seth that this was our chance and that we had to try and sneak out of this place and back to the car. He whispered in agreement and I let him out of the small storage space as we attempted to find our way out of the door that the men had kicked in. But we were trying to be absolutely as silent as we could, but as we were walking out, I managed to trip over something that was on the floor. I fell down onto the ground with a loud thud that the men definitely heard. And at this point, Seth and I just started running out through the door and towards our car. All the while, we could hear the two men running back down the stairs behind us. We practically leapt into the car and didn't waste a second hauling us out of there and back down the road towards the highway too. But we were so scared that I'd be willing to bet that we hit close to 60 miles per hour down this narrow dirt road. Luckily, it appeared that we got the jump on the two men as we thankfully never saw headlights behind us. I was fretting about the cattle gate that we had to pass on our way up the mountain though as I knew that I would have to get out and open it in order for us to get through. As we rounded a bend, Seth and I both saw the closed gate in front of us and I quickly jumped out of the car and opened up the gate as fast as I possibly could. I could hear the sound of a vehicle further up the road too as I jumped back into the car and we just sped off, not bothering to close the gate behind us. In what seemed like only about five minutes, we reached the bottom of the dirt road and turned onto the main highway. We quickly made our way back to my house, all the while looking in our mirrors hoping that the men hadn't followed us. Thankfully, it looked like we had lost them, and when we got back home to my house, both Seth and I breathed a collective sigh of relief and told each other that we would never go back there again. We didn't tell any of our parents about what had happened as we knew that they would be furious at us for doing something like we did without telling them. The next day, Seth and I sat down and talked about what had happened the night before and we just didn't understand who the men were and why they were up at the radio tower so late at night. We also were creeped out by the fact that the men just somehow saw us going up the dirt road and followed us. I really don't know what those two men were doing but I honestly don't think I want to either. So I was super skeptical of the paranormal or anything ghostly for years. Until I was on vacation with my family at the Waverly Hill Sanitarium. And we were going on a tour from about 6pm to 6am on an overnight lock-in kind of deal. Now, I don't believe in anything that's about to occur. We start in the infamous death tunnel or body chute where the guide proceeded to tell us that at one point, the whole tunnel was piled full of bodies top to bottom, which was pretty cool to be honest. There's nothing unusual and just graffiti down there too. We walk up to the first floor and still same thing, graffiti, some pentagrams and all that sort of stuff fast forward and nothing's going on and I'm kind of fascinated by the building, moonlight shining in through the sunroom, all that sort of stuff. As we pass the fourth floor, the guide asks us all to turn our lights off and tells us the fourth floor is the most active and we'll come back here later too. So we do as we're told and turn off our flashlights. My brother puts his in his pocket of his hoodie and I watched him do this. And a few minutes later, I see light out of the corner of my eye. I say to my brother, turn off your flashlight, and he says, it is. And not even a minute later, I, I see it again. I tell him to turn off the flashlight again, and it was on again, and he says that I swear I didn't turn it on. He says to me that it's definitely turned off now, and I don't think too much of it, so the tour continues. We get back down to the fourth floor and we all pile into the center of the hallway and the guide asks for a volunteer and I say, screw it, I'll do it. I have no clue what I'm doing, but uh, what the hell, it can't be too bad, right? So the guide tells me to walk down the end of the hallway slowly, keeping your eyes forward, touch the wall and come back. I say, all right, so I start walking and... I'm not going to lie, it was pretty creepy dark and I have my flashlight off and the only light is the moon coming in through the sunroom which is sufficient lighting but it really wasn't much. 
so I'm good and it's eerie and it's like really quiet so I'm walking and I swear that I start to see shadows out of the corner of my eye like brushing by but when I try and look directly there's nothing there to my right is where the sunroom and the shadows are and to my left are the rooms I'm walking just getting chills and I get to the end of the hall and I feel like I'm I'm floating it's hard to describe, but it just felt like I was levitating or something. I can't see anyone, and it's a really weird feeling, so I start to walk back, and I'm curious on what's been going on. And to my left, and now my right, the rooms are there, so I'm walking back, and I feel like I'm walking on clouds, and I look into room 423, and I swear to you that I see someone clear as day, sitting in a chair with no eyes. Obviously, I, I start to panic, but I try to keep my composure and keep walking now with a knot in my throat, heart pounding, and I get back to the group pale as a dead man, and they ask what's wrong, and I say nothing. I just felt like I was floating. The tour guide says, yeah, that's what I was going for at this point. Now, I know that I'm not tripping. I don't do drugs and I know my mental health is pretty decent enough to not have hallucinations and whatnot. And what I saw was definitely real, I began to think anyway. We continue the tour though and I keep my eyes locked on that room and I didn't see anybody leave or anyone go in and we get to the room and I walk in and I just feel really heavy. Again, it's, it's hard to describe but... I just felt condensed and heavy. The chair is laid out on its left side and I'm searching the room frantically to see if there's anyone hiding in the room or even a ladder at the window or something, like a, a place for someone to escape or something. And I'm just completely confused. Like I said, nobody came in or went out from that room and I kept my eyes on it the whole time. Anyway... The tour guide then says, last week when we had someone do the walk like you did, a gentleman saw something in this room, 423, that scared him so bad that he actually tried to jump out of the sunroom and I had to pull him off of the ledge. He couldn't describe what he saw clearly and only said that it had no eyes and we actually had to call an ambulance because it was freaking out so bad. Obviously, that was a massive shock to me and... I said nothing, but my stomach was in my throat at this point. We complete the tour though, and now I'm, I'm a complete believer. I strongly believe too that whatever it was, it's kind of stuck to me or something too, because I, I still see this thing when I'm alone, walking at night in the distance under street lamps. When I'm alone in the dark, I, I feel a presence, and I feel like it's him. I... I also see him in my dreams too and now I, I have this huge anxiety issue and horrible depression and I've, uh, I've even began an addiction and I know you guys might think I'm crazy but honestly I can't blame you for all of it but I was fine until that day and now this lingering thing just makes me feel like I'm, I'm never alone. I've been pretty desperate to try and fix this too and I've had mediums and I've spoken to Native Americans and I've done all sorts of exorcisms and sage things and I've even had priests bless me but nothing has done anything. At this point, it's been 10 years since I first saw it and I still have no idea what to do. This happened a couple of years ago, and it was during a visit to my grandmother in a small village in Mexico. But to give some context, my parents and I visited for about a week, and during that week, my mother's cousin also passed. He was in a, a car crash, and the local government was deeply involved. Months later, it turns out that he was actually murdered by the local cartel there. That really is a whole story in itself, but I decided to mention it because it happened that same week that we were visiting. As you can probably tell, overall that whole week was tragic and also extremely odd. So, some background. It happened about a night before we got the news about the passing. My uncle lives on the same plot of land my grandmother does and he owns a farm of chickens and roosters. 
my grandma's sister, the mother of the guy who passed, is technically their next door neighbor. They own the plot of land right next to my grandmother's, my grandmother plot. My grandmother's plot of land is actually adjacent to the local elementary school there, so her house is in the middle of pretty much nowhere. However, she does have a good sized plot of land that's surrounded by concrete walls for protection. The streets around her land only really get foot traffic when school is in session. Given the climate at the time too, any kind of foot traffic stops by sunset for sure. The village itself is pretty poor and everyone is familiar with each other there. They have a few rich people, but pretty much no middle class. Most houses are about equivalent to shacks, and my grandmother owns a concrete house that is decently sized, but otherwise plain. So, it was during the summer when my parents and I visited. I was on my summer break, and so were the schools there. And my parents and I were the only people there visiting my grandmother at the time, too. Every night, time is taken to be sure that all the doors are completely locked before heading to bed. But there's three doors that lead to the outside, all are made of metal with also a mesh frame door to keep the bugs out. That night, I distinctly remember asking my mum to help me lock the front door too. It's a heavy metal door with a secured lock that I was having difficulties closing. We also checked to make sure that the other doors were secured and locked as well. I'm going to mention the layout of my grandmother's house briefly too since it's somewhat important. So the first room you enter, which is the door that I was having a hard time closing, is basically a room with a bunch of beds. To the right is what is referred to as the middle room, which is just another bedroom. It connects the first room to my grandmother's room. You can actually look into the middle room and also see the first room when both doors are left open. These two doors are usually left open because they're heavy and scrape against the concrete floor really loudly. Now... Before heading to bed, I plugged my phone into the middle room to charge, which is where my dad was going to sleep in. My mum and I were sleeping in the same room with my grandmother. My mum and I shared a bed that was right next to the door that leads into the middle room. Right before falling to sleep, I could see into the first room because the two doors were left open like always. I had no recollection of any nightmares or dreams, and I basically slept pitch black until I woke up at a, an unknown time, just completely terrified. It was the weirdest thing, but my eyes just basically shot open and I had a, an indescribable sense of fear. The first thing I noticed was that the door next to me was completely shut. I didn't want to move even in the slightest and I didn't really know what to think. I felt too scared to even close my eyes and I just laid there completely still for an unknown amount of time. I came to the conclusion that I would rather wait for the sun to come up than to close my eyes again and... I was just really scared. Eventually, I, I heard the chickens starting to make noise, so I figured the sun was going to come up in the next few hours or so. But I noticed that the, the chickens were actually going kind of berserk, almost as if they were scared of something. And this deepened my fear, but I still lay there too scared to move. At this point, I was wondering why it hadn't woken up my mother or my grandmother, who were both extremely light sleepers, mind you. I mean, I was the heavy sleeper in the family, yet the chickens weren't waking either of them up. Eventually, they all settled down, though, and there was no sign of any sunlight. I occupied my time just listening to the air conditioner in the middle of the room. It's pretty old, the kind that you have to use a hose to water down, and it makes a continuous noise and then occasionally sputters, but its noises are almost routine, so I kind of felt like it was comforting. I could also hear the bed in the middle of the room creaking around, which I figured my dad was just moving around in his bed or something. Again, I couldn't see into the middle room, which I found odd that the door was closed. I'm a heavy sleeper, like I mentioned, so... I figured that there was a possibility that I remained asleep while the doors were closed or something. I remained still for who knows how long, but then I, I heard a noise that I've never ever heard before or since. It was extremely loud and it definitely came from the middle room. The volume was just as loud as the chickens, but didn't sound anything like them. I was petrified and I had no idea why it didn't wake anyone else up. Again, I, I can't even really describe the noise because it's nothing like I've ever heard before. I just laid there completely still though, 
long enough to listen to these noises just over and over again, and I wanted to think that it was the air conditioner until that noise happened the same time. I wanted to think that it was the creaking of the bed, but eventually that same noise also happened at the same time the bed was creaking, so it couldn't have been either of them. I also want to mention too that I didn't find it odd until later that just how much the bed was creaking. At this point, I, I just felt like I was going crazy. I still laid completely still, just stuck listening to the noises, and eventually uh, a second noise started to emerge. It sounded about the same as the first noise, but it was definitely distinguishable, like when two people speak. And oddly enough, it was as if they were conversing back and forth too. I started to move my arm against my mum while whispering mum over and over to try and wake her up. Like I said before, she's an extremely light sleeper, but this time she was having a really deep sleep. It got to the point, in fact, that I was basically shaking her and moving her around to try and wake her up. And finally, her eyes shot open and in that moment she actually heard the last noise that came from the middle room. She looked petrified and the first thing she actually said to me was, that noise isn't from this world. After that, the noises just completely stopped. My mum got up and tried to open the door leading into the middle room as slowly as possible, but it still made a lot of noise and the door opening woke my grandmother up. When we got into the middle room too, there was nothing in there and my dad was still completely asleep. I checked the time on my phone and it was around 3am at this point and apparently both doors in the middle room were shut completely. When we started checking around the house too, we noticed that all the doors were left open. My grandmother said that she opened them during the night, which kind of explains it. Extremely odd that she would do something like that to say the least, but she is pretty old and can be unreasonable like that. We looked around and checked out the outside, but aside from the doors, nothing was out of place. All we could really do was close them again and go back to bed. And the next morning, I woke up to my mum talking about the event to my uncle and some other family friends who came over for breakfast. She concluded on her own that it was a witch or something, and I really don't know what it was. I only ever bring it up when a close friend talks about aliens or any odd occurrences, because, to be completely honest, it was the weirdest thing that I've ever experienced, and to this day, I still have no idea what it was. Anyway... I hope you guys have enjoyed the story and if any of you guys have had a similar experience or something like this happen to you, I sure would love to hear it because I'm, uh, I'm trying to find some answers for all this.